Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and um, we are now celebrating 10 years on YouTube. Which is a hell of a lot of time, let me tell you. Um, 10 years ago, it was January 4th, 2011, and I was 22 years old, and I was trying my best to graduate from college. So, if you guys were around since then, thank you for sticking with me for so long, because... You guys kept me very much sane back then, and motivated. And if you guys are joining me any time in between, thank you. And here's hoping to another 10. I have a couple of videos lined up for you guys over the next couple of days. 10 of them, in fact, to celebrate 10 years. And each of these videos is a story I'd like to think of helped make me who I am. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best story. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the scariest story. It means that there's something significant that happened with this story. And I'd like to share those things with you before I re-record them. Uh, some I've never seen in many, many years, such as this one tonight. Curious Little Thing is the first story I ever recorded on this channel. And if you go back, way, way, way back, you can still hear it. I recorded it on a karaoke microphone with no background music and no knowledge about cleaning or denoising or equalizing audio or anything like that. So, hopefully, I have improved over the 10 years, and this is a story that is still very, very near and dear to me. This is Curious Little Thing by Chris Straub. I have an odd habit. A friend recently picked up on a habit I developed about a year ago. He noticed that when I enter a room, any room, and shut the door, I turn my face away from it and I close my eyes until I hear the lock click. Only after the door is fully closed will I open them. He gave me a hard time about it until I told him where it started. I work for a water seal company in St. Paul. We produce sealant for exposed wood, decks, boats, that kind of thing. You hear about sealant being a dirty word in the Ashland, Icker Falls, Ironton area... Not all those companies were part of the infamous Ethelor Summer. They wiped out the local economy in the 50s. I got sent to an industrial park outside of Ecker Falls on business. I checked into the Dismal Hotel, the Hotel Umbra, that looked like the decor hadn't been changed since the 1930s. The lobby wallpaper had gone yellow from decades of cigarette smoke, and everything had a fine layer of dust, including the old man behind the front desk. I hoped that the room would be in better shape. See, mine was on the fourth floor. Being an old place, the hostel had a rickety cable car, the kind with the double set of doors, one of those flexing metal gates and a solid outer pair of doors. If I shut the gate and latched it, I pressed the tiny black button for my floor. Just as the outer elevator doors were about to close, I was startled by the face of a young woman rushing at the gap between them. She was too late. The door shut. And after a moment, the elevator ascended. I thought nothing of it until I needed to take the elevator back down for one of my bags. See, I entered, I pushed the button for the lobby, and I pressed my tired back to the elevator wall opposite the doors. They were nearly completely shut again when I was surprised by a woman's face moving towards the gap, staring into the elevator through the gate. Too late to place her hand in to stop the doors from closing. This time I sprang forward and I held the door open button. I waited for a moment. From the opening I could see partly down the hallway. No one in sight. Still, holding the button down, I slid open the metal gate and craned my head into the hallway to look down the other direction. No one. I waited a moment. No trace of the girl, no recently shut hotel room door, no footsteps, no jingle of keys. I released the button, but did not lean back against the wall. I stood directly in front of where the gap in the doors would be, in the center of the elevator. After a pause, the outer doors again began to slide shut, to move towards each other until the space between them was the width of a young girl's face. And in that quarter second, several fingertips appeared, followed immediately by her face again, rushing from around the corner, staring at me as the doors met. 
I've been watching the gap where I thought she might be, so I saw her. She was she was about 13 years old and very pale, almost homely, with a, a pale complexion and neck length dark brown hair looked mused or slightly dirty. I didn't have time to glance down at her visible shoulder to see what she was wearing. I mean, from her behavior, I wondered if she was a runaway or a homeless person who had gotten into the building. She had a glassy, blank expression, tinged with a, a, a little desperation. Some distant desire or need. A look that could easily be accompanied by the words, Please help. The next time I passed the front desk, I asked the old man if he had seen a young girl running through. I heard the stories then, he said between throat clearing, rocking gently in his seat. Young Maddie, she's been here for a long time. Takes a liking to gentlemen guests. Always has been shy, never says a word. Not a word. Just curious. I told him I hadn't heard any stories. There'd been a girl taking the stairs and standing in front of my elevator on every floor. That's our Maddie, he says. She likes you, then. Sweet on you. She just wants to see, that's all. Just to see. It's all she ever does. Curious little thing. Just wants to see. I stayed at the Hotel Umbra for three nights. It was a four-night business trip. The last night I tried sleeping in my car. Didn't help. Let me tell you about young Maddie. You only catch glimpses of her, of a face with a resigned look of quiet desperation, dominated by a pair of wide, dark eyes. Locked doors, barricades, nothing made a difference. She gets inside. I never saw her longer than half a second. Every time I laid eyes on her, she, she retreated instantly, only to appear again an hour or two later, and an hour or two if I was lucky. Let me tell you about where I saw young Maddie. Every time I shut the door to my bathroom, in my hotel room, I saw her. If I watched as I shut it, at the last possible second, I'd see the crescent of her face moving fast at the gap. I'd throw the door open to find nothing. And every time I closed the closet door, I saw her. If I watched that gap, she'd suddenly be inside the closet, leaning her head to watch me just as it shut. It's as if, it's as if she knew where to go, where to be so that my eye would meet hers. But there was never an impact, never a moment when she'd make contact with the door or the wall. The first time I sat at that writing table, I saw her. As I closed the large bottom drawer, she rushed at the gap from inside the drawer, her eyes wide, pleading for something I couldn't give. I pulled the drawer from its rails and I threw it to the floor. I spent that last night in my car, but like I said, it did no good, tossing and turning on that rental car seat. The back ratcheted as flat as I could get it. I had to open my eyes sometimes, and if there was a place for her to dart from my view when I opened them, she did. In the side view mirror, or peeking over the hood of my car, once upside down at the top of the windshield, as if she was on the roof. I'm back at St. Paul again. And I've been back for a year. But Maddie hasn't stopped. If I keep my eyes open long enough, if I watch a place long enough, I'll eventually catch sight of movement. You know, the copier in my office, pile of boxes in the alleyway, column in a dark, quiet parking lot. And my eyes will get there just in time to see her eye retreating from view. There was never anything there when I go to look. So I, I've stopped looking. And that's how I've had to change things since the Hotel Umbra. See, I've stopped looking. I keep my eyes shut when I close doors and when I shut drawers and cabinets, fridges, coolers, the trunk of my car, not all spaces. Just ones that are big enough. At least that's how it used to work. So I was getting ready for bed a few nights ago. I was standing in front of my bathroom mirror, door shut, cabinets shut. Watching myself floss. I opened up wide to get my molars. And I swear, 
I swear. I saw fingertips retreat down the back of my throat. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And today's video is once again celebrating the 10 years on YouTube. This is a look back at a story I don't think I've recorded in quite a few years. I think I may have done one reboot of this quite a while back, but um, this was a story that has stuck with me quite a bit. I think this was actually a story I even took to conventions for a little while. Tulpa is one of those classic creepypasta stories, and you'll see a lot of them as uh, we go through the celebration for this anniversary. This is one of those stories that I saw on creepypasta.com way, way back when I was working at at t and one of the ones that really made me question if creepypastas were real or not, because that was the big question back in the day before uh, we really started exploding and expanding and turning into everything that we are today. So really, I feel like this is a story I knew about well before I even knew what creepypastas were. So, for tonight, we have Tulpa by an unknown anonymous author. Last year, I spent six months participating in what I was told was a psychological experiment. I found an ad in my local newspaper looking for imaginative people looking to make good money. And since it was the only job I was even remotely qualified for, I gave them a call and we arranged an interview. They told me that all I would have to do is stay in a room alone with sensors attached to my head to read my brain activity. And while I was there, I would visualize a double of myself. They called it my tulpa. It seemed easy enough, and I agreed to do it as soon as they told me how much I would be paid. And the next day I began, they brought me to a simple room and gave me a bed. Then attached sensors to my head and hooked them into a little black box on the table beside me. They talked me through the process of visualizing my double again, and explained that if I got bored or restless, instead of moving around, I should visualize my double moving around, or I should try to interact with him, and so on. The idea was to keep him with me the entire time I was in the room. I had trouble with it for the first few days. It was more controlled than any sort of daydreaming I had done before. I'd imagine my double for a few minutes, then grow distracted. But by the fourth day, I could manage to keep him uh, present, for the entire six hours. They told me I was doing very well. The second week, they gave me a different room with wall-mounted speakers. They told me that they wanted to see if I could still keep the tulpa with me in spite of distracting the stimuli. The music was discordant, ugly, and unsettling, and it made the process a little more difficult, but I managed nonetheless. The next week they played even more unsettling music, punctuated with shrieks, feedback loops, what sounded like an old school modem dialing up and guttural voices speaking some foreign language. I just laughed it off. You know, I was, you know, I was a pro by then. And after about a month, I started to get bored. To liven things up, I started interacting with my doppelganger. We'd have conversations, we'd play rock, paper, scissors, or I'd imagine him juggling or breakdancing or whatever caught my fancy. I asked the researchers if my foolishness would adversely affect their study, but they encouraged me. So we played, we communicated, and, you know, that was fun for a while. And then it got a little strange. I was telling him about my first date one day, and he corrected me. I said my date was wearing a yellow top. He told me, no, it was a green one. I thought about it for a second, and I realized, I realized he was right. It creeped me out, you know, and after my shift that day, I talked to the researchers about it. You're using the thought form to access your subconscious, they explained. You knew on some level that you were wrong, and you subconsciously corrected yourself. What had been creepy was actually suddenly cool, you know, I was talking to my subconscious, it... It took some practice, but I found that I could question my tulpa and access all sorts of memories. I could make it quote whole pages of books I'd read once, years before, or, or things I was taught and immediately forgot in high school. It was awesome. 
That was around the time I started calling up my double outside of the research center. Not often at first, but I was so used to imagining him by now that it almost seemed odd to not see him. So whenever I was bored, I'd visualize my double. And eventually, I started doing it almost all the time. It was amusing to take him along like an invisible friend. I, I imagined him when I was hanging out with friends or visiting my mom. I even brought him along on a date once. I didn't need to speak to him aloud, so I was able to carry out conversations and, and no one was the wiser. I know that sounds strange, okay, but, but it was fun. Not only was he a walking repository of everything I knew and everything I had forgotten, he also seemed more in touch with me than I did at times. He had an, an uncanny grasp, the minutia of body language, even to the point that I didn't realize that I was picking up on it. For example, I thought the date I brought him along on was going pretty badly, but he pointed out how she was laughing a little too hard at my jokes and, and leaning towards me as I spoke and, and, a, and a bunch of other subtle cues I wasn't consciously picking up on. See, I listened, and, um, <laughs> well, let's just say that the date went very well. Well, by the time I had been at the research center for four months, he was with me constantly. You know, the researchers approached me one day after my shift and asked if I if I'd stopped visualizing him, and I denied it. You know, they seemed pleased. I silently asked my double if he knew what prompted that, and he just shrugged it off. You know, so just so did I. I withdrew a little from the world at that point. I was. I was, I was having trouble relating to people. It seemed to me that they were so confused and unsure of themselves. Well, I had a manifestation of myself to confer with. It made socializing awkward. Yeah, you know, nobody ever seemed aware of the reasons behind their actions, why some things made them mad and others made them laugh. They didn't know what moved them, but I did. Or at least I could ask myself and I can get an answer. A friend confronted me one evening. He pounded at the door until I answered. And he came in fuming, swearing up a storm. You haven't answered when I call you in fucking weeks, you dick, he yelled. What's your fucking problem? I was about to apologize to him, and I probably would have offered to hit the bars with him that night. But my my tulpa grew suddenly furious. Hit him, it said. And before I knew what I was doing, I had. I heard his nose break, he fell to the floor, and... He came up swinging, and we beat each other up and down my apartment. I was more furious than I'd ever been, and I was not merciful. I knocked him to the ground, I gave him two savage kicks to the ribs, and that's when he fled, hunched over and sobbing. The police were by a few minutes later. Told him that he'd been the instigator, and since he wasn't around to refute me, they let me off with a warning. My topo was grinning the entire time. We spent the night crawling about my victory and sneering over how badly I'd beaten my friend. It wasn't until the next morning when I was checking out my black eye and my cut-up lip in the mirror that I remembered what had set me off. See, my double was the one who had grown furious. It wasn't me. I'd been feeling guilty and a little ashamed, but he'd goaded me into a vicious fight with a concerned friend. He was present, of course. He knew my thoughts. You don't need him anymore. You don't need anyone else, he told me. And I felt my skin crawl. I explained all this to the researchers who employed me, but they just laughed it off. You can't be scared of something that you imagined, one told me. My double stood beside him and nodded his head then smirked at me. I tried to take their words to heart, but over the next few days I found myself growing more and more anxious around my tulpa, and it seemed that, that he was changing. He looked taller, more menacing. His eyes twinkled with mischief, and I saw malice in his constant smile. No job was worth losing my mind over, I decided. If he was out of control, I'd put him down. I was so used to him at that point that visualizing him was an automatic process, so I... I started trying my damnedest to not visualize him. It took a few days, but it started to work somewhat. I could get rid of him for hours at a time, but every time he came back, he seemed... He seemed worse. His skin seemed ashen. His teeth more pointed. He hissed and gibbered and threatened and swore. 
The discordant music I'd been listening to for months seemed to accompany him everywhere. Even when I was at home, I'd relax and slip up, no longer concentrating on not seeing him, and he'd be there. That howling noise with him. I was still visiting the research center and spending my six hours there. I mean, I needed the money. I thought they weren't aware that I was now actively not visualizing my tulpa. But I was wrong. After my shift one day, about five and a half months in, two impressive men grabbed and restrained me, and someone in a lab coat jabbed a hypodermic needle into my body. I woke up from my stupor back in the room, strapped to the bed, music blaring with my doppelganger standing over me, cackling. He hardly looked human anymore. His features were twisted. His eyes were sunken in their sockets and filmed over like a corpse's. He was... He was much taller than me, but hunched over. His hands were twisted, and his fingernails were like talons. He was, in short, fucking terrifying. I tried to will him away, but I couldn't seem to concentrate. He, he giggled, and he tapped the ivy in my arm. I thrashed in my restraints as best I could, but I could hardly move at all. They're pumping you full of the good shit, I think. How's the mind? All fuzzy. He leaned closer as he spoke. I gagged. His breath smelled like spoiled meat. I tried to focus, but I couldn't banish him. The next few weeks were terrible. Every so often, someone in a doctor's coat would come in and inject me with something or, or force-feed me a pill, and they kept me dizzy and unfocused and sometimes left me hallucinating or delusional. My thought form was still present, constantly mocking. He interacted with, or perhaps caused, my delusions. I hallucinated that my mother was there, scolding me, and then, and then he cut her throat and her blood showered me. It was, it was so real that I could taste it. The doctors never spoke to me. I begged at times, screamed, hurled invectives, demanded answers. They never spoke to me. They may have talked to my tulpa, my personal monster, but I'm not sure. I was so doped up and confused that it may have just been more delusion, but I remember, I remember them talking to him. I grew convinced that he was the real one, and I was the thought form. He encouraged that line of thought at times, mocked me at others. Another thing that I pray was a delusion was that he could touch me. More than that, he could, he could hurt me. He poked and prodded at me if he felt I wasn't paying enough attention to him. And once he grabbed me and he squeezed till I told him that I loved him. And another time he slashed my forearm with one of his talons. I still have a scar. Most days I can convince myself that I, that I injured myself and just hallucinated that he was responsible. Most days. Then, one day, while he was telling me a story about how he was going to gut everyone I loved, starting with my sister, he paused. A querulous look crossed his face and reached out and he touched my head like my mother used to when I was feverish. He stayed still for a long moment, then he smiled. All thoughts are creative, he told me. And then he walked out the door. Three hours later, I was given an injection and I passed out. I awoke unrestrained, shaking. I made my way to the door and I found it unlocked. I walked into the empty hallway and then I ran and I stumbled more than once, but I made it down the stairs and out into the lot behind the building. And there I collapsed, weeping like a child. I knew I had to keep moving, but I couldn't manage it. I got home eventually. I don't, I don't remember how. I locked the door. I shoved the dresser against it. I took a long shower and I slept for a day and a half. And nobody came for me in the night. Nobody came the next day or the one after that. It was over. I'd spent a week locked in that room, but it felt like a century. I had withdrawn so much from my life beforehand that nobody had even known that I was missing. The police didn't find anything. The, the research center was empty when they searched it. The paper trail fell apart. The names I'd given them were aliases. Even the money I'd received was apparently untraceable. I'd recovered as much as one can. 
I don't leave the house much, and I have panic attacks when I do. I, I cry a lot, I don't sleep much, and I... I have nightmares when I do. It's over, I tell myself. I survived. I used the concentration those bastards taught me to convince myself. And it works. Sometimes. Not today, though. You see, you see, three days ago, I got a phone call from my mother. There'd been a tragedy. My sister being the latest victim in a killing spree, the police say. The perpetrator mugs his victims. And then he guts them. The funeral was this afternoon. It was... It was as lovely a service as a funeral can be, I suppose. I was a little distracted, though, because all I could hear was the music coming from somewhere distant. Discordant. Unsettling stuff that sounds like feedback and shrieking and a modem dialing up. I hear it still. A little louder now. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepy Pasta, and we are celebrating 10 years on YouTube. Tonight's story, as all of you probably figured, I would have to do at least one of these haunted video game stories. But Pokemon Black, out of all of the Pokemon stories, or all of the haunted video game stories, I wouldn't say is the best one. But it was absolutely the first one that I had ever seen. Um, once again, just like Tulpa, this is one that I saw well before I became MCP, and one that I had not considered ever bringing up on the channel, because originally I had done stories that I had found at creepypasta.com, but this one was actually sent to me by a friend, because it was on a image of a Facebook post, and the friend believed that Pokemon Black was real, <laughs> and thought it was good for me to record something like this and talk about something that was a real haunted game. And I believe now you actually can find hacks or fan-made versions of Pokemon Black, because at the root of it, it's not a story that feels like if you play this game, you die in real life. It's just a game that has a very, very dark overtone. So, tonight's story is Pokemon Black version by an unknown anonymous author. I'm what you call a collector of bootleg Pokemon games. Uh, Pokemon Diamond and Jade, uh, Chaos Black, etc. It's amazing the frequency with which you can find them at pawn shops, at Goodwill, at flea markets, and such. They're generally fun. Even if they're unplayable, which they often are. The mistranslations, the poor quality, it makes them unintentionally humorous. I've been able to find more of the ones that I've been playing online, but there's one that I haven't seen any mention of. I bought it at a flea market about five years ago. And here's a picture of the cartridge. In case anyone recognizes it, that is. But unfortunately, when I moved two years ago, I lost the game. So, I can't provide you with the screen caps. I'm sorry about that. The game started with the familiar Nidorino and Gengar into the red and blue versions. However, the press start screen had been altered. You see, red was there. But the Pokemon did not cycle through. It also said black version under the Pokemon logo. Upon seeing new game, the game starts with the Professor Oak speech, and it quickly becomes evident that the game was essentially Pokemon Red version. After selecting your starter, if you looked at your Pokemon, you'd have, in addition to Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle, another Pokemon. Ghost. The Pokemon was level 1. It had the sprite of the ghost that was encountered in Lavender Town before obtaining the Sylph Scope. It had one attack. Curse. I know there was a real move named Curse, but the attack did not exist in Generation 1, so it appears that it must have been hacked in. Defending Pokemon were unable to attack Ghost. It would only say they were too scared to move. When the move Curse was used in battle, the screen would cut to black. The cry of the defending Pokemon would be heard, but it was distorted, played at a much lower pitch than normal. 
The battle screen would then reappear, and the defending Pokémon would be gone. If used in battle against a trainer, when the Pokéballs representing their Pokémon would appear in the corner, they would have one fewer Pokéball. The implication was that the Pokémon had died. What's even stranger is that after defeating a trainer, and seeing Red receive $200 for winning, the battle commands would appear again. If you selected Run, the battle would end as it normally does. You could always select Curse, and if you did, upon returning to the overworld, the trainer's sprite would be gone. After leaving and re-entering the area, the spot where the trainer had been would be replaced with a tombstone, similar to the ones at Lavender Town. The move Curse was not usable in all instances. It would fail against Ghost-type Pokémon. It would also fail if it was used against trainers that you would have to face again, such as your rival or Giovanni. It was usable in your final battle against them, however. I figured this was the gimmick of the game, allowing you to use the previously uncaptured ghosts, and because Curse made the gameplay so easy, I essentially used it throughout the whole adventure. The game changed quite a bit after defeating the Elite Four, though. After viewing the Hall of Fame, which consisted of Ghost and a couple of Pokémon used for HMs, the screen cut to black. A box appeared with the words, Many years later. It then cut to Lavender Town. An old man was standing looking at tombstones. You then realized this man was your character. The man moved at only about half your normal walking speed. You no longer had any Pokemon with you, not even Ghost, who up to this point had been impossible to remove from your party through depositing in the PC. The overworld was entirely empty. There were no people at all. There were still the tombstones of the trainers that you used Curse on, however. You could go pretty much anywhere in the overworld at this point, though your movement was limited by the fact that you had no Pokémon to use HMs, and regardless of where you went, the music of Lavender Town continued in an infinite loop. After wandering for a while, I found that if you go to Diglett's Cave, one of the cuttable bushes that normally blocks the path on the other side is no longer there, allowing you to advance and return to Pallet Town. Upon entering your house and going to the exact tile where you start the game, the screen would cut to black. And then a sprite of a Caterpie appears. It was then replaced by a Weedle, then a Pidgey. And I soon realized as the Pokemon progressed from Radita to Blastoise that these were all of the Pokemon that I had used Curse on. After the end of my rival's team, a youngster appeared. Then a bug catcher. And these were the trainers that I'd cursed. Throughout the sequence, the Lavender Town music was playing, but it was slowly decreasing in pitch. And by the time your rival appears on screen, it was more like a demonic rumble. Another cut to black. A few moments later, the battle screen suddenly appears, and your trainer sprite was now that of an old man, the same as the one who teaches you how to catch Pokemon in Viridian City. Ghost appears on the other side, along with the words, Ghost wants to fight. You couldn't use items. You had no Pokemon. If you tried to run, you couldn't escape. The only option was fight. Using fight would immediately cause you to use struggle, which didn't affect Ghost, but did chip off a bit of your own HP. When it was Ghost's turn to attack, he would simply say, dot, dot, dot. Eventually, when your HP reached a critical point, Ghost would finally use Curse. Screen cut to black one final time. And regardless of what buttons you press, you're permanently stuck in the black screen. At this point, the only thing you could do was to turn the Game Boy off. When you played again, New Game was the only option. The game would erase itself. I played through the hack game many, many times, and every time the game ended with this sequence. Several times I didn't use Ghost at all, though he was impossible to remove from the party. In these cases, it didn't show any Pokemon or trainers, and simply cut to the climactic battle with Ghost. I'm not sure what the motives were behind the creator of this hack. It wasn't widely distributed, so it was presumably not for any monetary gain. It was very... Well done for a bootleg. Seems he was trying to convey a message, though it seems 
I'm the sole receiver of this message. Not entirely sure what it was, the inevitability of death. The pointlessness of it all. Perhaps he was simply trying to inject morbid death and darkness into a children's game. But regardless, this children's game has made me think. And it's made me cry. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And um, we're once again celebrating the 10 years on YouTube. <laughs> a huge thank you to all of you guys who have made that possible. For tonight's story, uh, once again, it has to be included. Uh, it, I need to have a lost episode Creepypasta for sure. This is not the best lost episode Creepypasta. And I will leave that very, very wide topic up for debate all of you, what exactly was your favorite, or what you believe is the best lost episode creepypasta out there, out of the many, 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 many that there are. But this one's very, I wouldn't say dear to me, as much as I would say special to me. <laughs> Dead Bart is a video that I posted within my first year on YouTube, and it was the video where I received my very first dislike <laughs> and um i think that's incredibly significant because i want to say i was 15 videos in before dead bart popped up and i hadn't gotten dislikes since then i thought i was doing exceptionally well uh but then my first dislike came in and let me tell you i guess it <laughs> i mean it's hard to describe today where i can't count the number of dislikes my videos get but, um, I guess back then it was enough, enough to make me remember. So, for uh, all of the likes and dislikes that this gets, here is Dead Bart by K.L. Simpson. You know how Fox has a weird way of counting Simpsons episodes? They refuse to count a couple of them. It makes the amount of episodes inconsistent. The reason for this is a lost episode from season one. See, finding details about this missing episode is difficult. Nobody who's working on the show at the time likes to talk about it. From what's been pieced together, the lost episode was written entirely by Matt Groening. During production of the first season, Matt started to act strangely. He was, he was very quiet. He seemed nervous and morbid. Mentioning this to anyone who was present results in them getting very angry forbidding you to even mention it to Matt. I first heard of it at an event where David Silverman was speaking. Someone in the crowd asked about the episode, and Silverman simply left the stage, ending the presentation hours early. The episode's production number was 7G06. The title was Dead Bart. The episode labeled 7G06, Moaning Lisa, was made later and given Dead Bart's production code to hide the latter's existence. In addition to getting angry, asking anyone who was on the show about this will cause them to do everything they can to stop you from directly communicating with Matt Groening. At a fan event, I managed to follow him after he spoke to the crowd, and eventually, I had a chance to talk to him alone as he was leaving the building. He didn't seem upset that I followed him, and probably expected a typical encounter with an obsessed fan. When I mentioned the lost episode, though, all color drained from his face. And he started trembling. When I asked him if he could tell me any details, he sounded like he was on the verge of tears. He grabbed a piece of paper, he wrote something on it, and he handed it to me. He begged me never to mention the episode again. The piece of paper had a website address on it. I'd rather not say what it was, you know, for reasons you'll see in a second. I, I entered the address into my browser. I came to a site that was completely black, except for a line of yellow text. Download link. I clicked on it, and a file started downloading. Once the file was downloaded, my computer went crazy. It was, it was, it was the worst virus I had ever seen. System restore didn't work. The entire computer had to be rebooted. Before doing this, though, I copied the file onto a CD. I tried to open it to my now empty computer, and as I suspected, well, there was a um, episode of The Simpsons on it. The episode started off like any other episode, but it had a very poor quality animation. 
Now, if you've seen the original animation of some enchanting evening, it, it was similar, less stable. The first act was fairly normal. The way the characters acted was a little off, see? Homer seemed angrier. Marge seemed depressed. Lisa seemed anxious. Bart seemed to have genuine anger and hatred for his parents. The episode was about the Simpsons going on a plane trip. At the end of the first act, the plane was taking off. Bart was fooling around, as you would expect. However, as the plane was about 50 feet off the ground, Bart broke a window on the plane, and he was sucked out. At the beginning of the series, Matt had an idea that the animated style of the Simpsons world represented life, and that death turned things more realistic. This was used in this episode. The picture of Bart's corpse was barely recognizable. They took full advantage of it not having to move and made an almost photorealistic drawing of his dead body. Act 1 ended on the shot of Bart's corpse. When Act 2 started, Marge, Homer, and Lisa were sitting at their table crying. The crying went on and on. It got more pained and sounded more realistic, better acting than you would think possible. The animation started to decay even more as they cried, and you could hear murmuring in the background. The characters could barely be made out. They were stretching and blurring. They looked like deformed shadows with random bright colors thrown on them. There were faces looking in the window, flashing in and out, so you, you were never sure what they looked like. The crying went on for all, all of Act 2. Then Act 3 opened with a title card saying, One Year Had Passed. Homer, Marge, and Lisa were skeletally thin. They were sitting at the table. There was no sign of Maggie or the pets. They decided to visit Bart's grave. Springfield was completely deserted, and as they walked to the cemetery, the houses became more and more decrepit. They all looked abandoned. When they got to the grave, Bart's body was just... just lying in front of a tombstone. Looking just like it did at the end of Act One. The family started crying again. Eventually, they stopped and just, just stared at Bart's body. The camera zoomed in on Homer's face, and according to summaries, Homer tells a joke at this part, but it isn't audible in the version I saw. You can't tell what Homer's saying. The view zoomed out as the episode came to a close. The tombstones in the background had the names of every Simpsons guest star on them. Some of them, no one had heard of in 1989. Some that hadn't been on the show yet. And all of them had death dates on them. For guests who had died since, like Michael Jackson and George Harrison, the dates were when they would die. The credits were completely silent. It seemed handwritten. The final image was the Simpson family on their couch like in the intros, but all drawn in hyper-realistic styles, lifeless styles. Same like Bart's corpse. A thought occurred to me after seeing the episode for the first time that you could try to use the tombstones to predict the death of living Simpsons guest stars. But there's... There's something odd about most of the ones who haven't died yet. Let's see... All the deaths seem to be listed as the same date. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we're once again celebrating 10 years on YouTube. As of January 4th, it has been 10 years on YouTube in 2021. Tonight's story is one that I think I've definitely redone probably two, maybe three times. Um, but I've redone it a few times because it is special to me. I polled on Twitter to see what you guys thought were classic creepypasta stories. And I will admit that a lot of the ones that will show up on this list are taken from that poll. However, the Russian sleep experiment, and honestly, I could say probably cupcakes, um, are two stories that stick out quite a bit because these are my first real deep dives into shock and gory horror when it comes down to being Mr. Creepypasta. Like, I mean, I've seen Saw and Hostel and everything like that in movie theaters, but 
trying to act out those parts here was different. And honestly, it was challenging in a, in a very new and different way. So in a lot of ways, the Russian sleep experiment really kind of stuck with me over that amount of time because of just how dark and blood soaked and gory it really gets. And I think in a lot of ways, it kind of stuck with all of you for that same reason, thinking that maybe something so gut tearing and bloody could actually have existed or actually could have happened. Who knows? Either way, this is one of the ones you all definitely said was a classic creepypasta story, and if it helped make all of you, then it certainly helped make me. This is The Russian Sleep Experiment, by an unknown anonymous author. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using an experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor their oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and five-inch thick glass portal-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was stocked with books, cots to sleep on, but no bedding, running water and a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised falsely that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and their general tone of their conversations took on a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were, and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other, and began alternately whispering into the microphones and the one-way mirrored portals. Oddly, they all seemed to think that they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber, repeatedly yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it, or rather, didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphones until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces, and pasted them calmly over the glass portals. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering in the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure they were working, since they thought it impossible that no sound could be coming from the five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something that they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chamber, hoping to provoke any response from the captives that they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice response. We no longer wished to be freed. Debate broke out amongst the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more response using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. 
The chamber was flushed to the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air, and immediately voices from the microphones began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was open, and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever. And so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them were in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand, not with teeth as the researchers initially thought. Closer examinations of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most of it, if not all of it, was self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four test subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remain in place. The skin and most of the muscles around the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could be seen to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that had been ripped off and eaten over the course of a day. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility, but still many refused to return to the chamber to remove for the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternately begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on, lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. One of the Russian soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured by having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his leg severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count ones that committed suicide, in the weeks following the incident. In the struggles, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured, and he bled out almost immediately. The medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than ten times the human dose of morphine, and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arms of one doctor. When his heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he had bled out, to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood, even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach and just repeat the words more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas, demanding it to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room the facility had. In the process of preparing the subject to have his organs placed back within his body, it was found that he was effectively immune to the sedatives that they gave him to prepare him for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through the four-inch wide leather strap on his wrist, even through the weight of a 200-pound soldier holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy of the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal level of oxygen. His muscles, that were still attached to his skeleton, were badly torn, and he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed, he was unable to beg or object to surgery. 
and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near to him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, that they try the surgery without anesthetic, and did not react for the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it should not be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting the surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eyes met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well. Although they had been injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation, the surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subject could only follow the attending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they had injured themselves, why they had ripped their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced, and they were placed back into the chamber awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of their military benefactors for having failed the stated goal of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, an ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had their restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all of his might. First his left, then his right. Then his left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off the pillow and blinking repeatedly. Having been the first to be wired for EEG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the time, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he was repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyelids slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time as his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwaves showed the same flatlines as the one who had just died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as three researchers. One of the named three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point-blank between the eyes then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed the gun at the remaining subject, still restrained to a bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things! Not with you! He screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? He demanded. I must know! The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. 
The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart, and fired. The EEG flatlined, and the subject weakly choked out. So nearly free. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are once again celebrating 10 years on YouTube. We are pretty far down the list. I think we just passed halfway now, so we're almost through our 10 videos that are important to me, or 10 videos that have made up who I am. And I don't think any of you are surprised to see a Slenderman video here. If there's one Creepypasta monster I could absolutely say is responsible for making me who I am, who's not Jeff the Killer, then it would be Slenderman. Slenderman, I feel like, has ingrained himself into just about every facet of what creepypastas are, or what online horror is, or what ARGs are, and I don't think I could ever get away from talking about creepypastas without talking about creepypasta monsters, or talking about creepypasta OCs, or talking about, I guess, what at this point is considered to either be classics or memes. So, Tall, Thin, and Faceless is absolutely one of the best Slenderman stories, at least in my opinion, that I've ever recorded. And I've recorded it two or three times by now, but as a part of this series, it is absolutely something that made me who I am. This is Tall, Thin, and Faceless by an unknown anonymous author. Walls. White walls. White padded walls. Day in and day out. White padded walls. Let me tell you why I see white padded walls day in and day out. I am, or at least according to several doctors, Certifiably insane. Hallucinations, paranoia, schizophrenia, multiple personality disorder, the list goes on. I was a normal working class man living the American dream. I had a wife, two children. My income was high, my debt was low. I had it all, and then... And then things started to go wrong. They started to go in a direction I... I couldn't even fathom. My wife and I had always wanted to go to the British Isles, but for the longest time, the money wasn't there. It took seven years and two promotions before we could even begin to think realistically. Anyway, after months of careful planning and preparation, we were on a plane flying over the Atlantic Ocean. Just me and her. No kids, no job. Nothing but beautiful scenery and relaxation for 24 straight days. Fast forward a week. Having taken in many of the big city sites, we decided to see some of the smaller places out in the countryside. So we packed a small bag of essentials, we took a cab into the rural side of England, and this is where things this is where things start to go wrong. Not the the whole world is coming to an end wrong, even though it sure feels like it. Over the it was just wrong. We came across an old tailor in a moderately decorated cabin. He said he'd been making suits for over 65 years. My interest was piqued. I decided to splurge a little bit and buy one. Nothing beats the craftsmanship of a well-tailored suit. After paying for it and calling for a cab, a picture on a wall caught my eye. It was old. It's black and white, mid-50s. It was a very tall, very slim suited man standing on a grassy plain. His face appeared to be smudged out. It was old. I didn't think much of it. Even so, something about this picture was unnerving. It gave an odd vibe. It felt almost menacing. I inquired about the photo, but the odd man refused to talk about it. That just added fuel to my mental fire. Days upon days had passed. My wife and I took in every site, every castle, every grassy knoll we possibly could. But alas, eventually we had to go home. Part of us wanted to stay, but we were exhausted. 
There was no way we could spend it any longer there. Our flight back home was vague, as we were both asleep most of the time. The drive back home was hazy. We just wanted to relax, and as I pulled into the driveway, something was off. You know, something just, it didn't feel right. I got that same feeling I had when I saw the picture inside the Taylor's home. It was a, it was a feeling of dread, curiosity. I didn't want to continue, but my mind forced me to. I stepped out of my car, and when I stood onto the concrete, my legs suddenly gave out. I fell onto the ground and onto my right hand, and I found myself unable to force myself up. I must be more tired than I thought. My wife helped me up and supported me up to the bedroom. I felt I was going to be asleep for a very long time. Or so I thought. That night I was plagued by nightmares of the suited man on the grassy plain. It wasn't really a bad dream, as much as it was his presence haunting me in my subconscious, just just standing there. Unnaturally tall, unnaturally thin, standing there without a face, without an identity, and no, no matter how hard I tried, his face never focused. It was as though the picture had come alive in my thoughts, but remained unchanged. This went on until I had been abruptly awoken by the sound of the smashing of a lamp. I raced down two flights of stairs, leading from the bedroom to the living room, armed with only the brick that we used as a doorstop. I slowly crept to where the only lamp in our house used to be. I knelt down to pick up a piece to examine when I, when I felt a slight, a slight blow of wind from behind me like a person running past. I shot up faster than a startled cat. I spun around to see what or who it was. My eyes had still not adjusted, so surrounding me was nothing but darkness. My next thought was to, to listen, you know. Nothing. Not a single thing, not even the sound of a house settling. Maybe it was my nightmare or fatigue playing tricks on me. Maybe we had a slight tremor that caused the lamp to inch off the table. Regardless, I was tired. I sorely wanted to get some nightmare-free sleep. But it didn't happen. Throughout the rest of the night, the slender man was everywhere within my dreams. He was a bit curious, though, so he only, he only ever seemed to cautiously hide behind trees. Only in the original photo was he completely exposed. Even subconsciously, I wished that I, I hadn't moved next to a forest knowing that he could be lurking. Watching me analyzing me. It didn't take long to force myself awake. 10.46 a.m. I looked to my left. I looked to my right. My wife was calmly sleeping. Lucky her. I dragged myself out of bed and slowly made my way downstairs. I half expected the TV to be blaring with my kids' eyes glued to the screen, but then I realized they were at their grandma's house. They were due back that day. Eh, I was going to miss the quiet. It was all right. I missed my kids even more. I continued down the stairs, hoping to get a game of solitaire in on the computer when something made me feel very weak and hollow. The lamp wasn't broken, but it wasn't brand new either. Someone took the pieces and shoddily glued them back together, and the glue wasn't glue. It was black and rubbery, like tar. I would have tasted it for origin, but that, that never is a good idea. My wife needed to wake up, and soon. I was starting to panic. I explained what happened the night before, about the lamp and the nightmares and such. She just rolled her eyes and told me I was on something. <laughs> Wives. Sometimes I think they do it on purpose. Still, feeling uneasy from this morning, I managed to force myself to look out into the forest behind our house. It was very calm. Nothing out of the ordinary. It wasn't completely dark, so it didn't look nearly as ominous as it usually did at night. I was badly lamenting this night in particular. And suddenly I saw a light out of the corner of my eye. One that caused me to nearly jump out of my skin. It was just it was just the kids being dropped off. <laughs> I swear I was thinking too much into this. I couldn't keep my nerves steady half the time. Hours passed. We played with the children, we put them to bed. We relaxed on the couch. My wife was asleep on my chest. I was nodding off. I 
slowly closed my eyes. It wasn't long before the quiet was broken and my wife and I were woken up. A window broke upstairs. In a panic flurry, we ran up the stairs as fast as we could. Our eldest son, scared out of his mind, said it came from his brother's room. Without even thinking, I kicked the door in. Only the nightlight in the far corner brought light into the pitch black room. And there he was. The man from my dreams. The slender man hovering over my son's bed. Having seen him, I acted without even knowing what was going on. Punches were thrown, long black tendrils whipped all around. The last thing I remember was being held tightly above the ground and thrown against a wall. And that's when I blacked out. When I came to, my wife was in tears. I had three cracked ribs. My son was gone. The Slender Man had my son, and there was nothing I could do. But I knew... I knew he was going to come back, and that was when I would get him. The rest of the day was full of emotion. My wife could hardly stop crying. Our other son was in a constant state of shock. I could, I could barely think straight. I did, however, manage to call the police. I told them my son had been abducted by a man in a long black suit. I kept the details of the tendrils to myself in fear that they wouldn't believe me, but that was the least of my worries. I needed to figure out when he would return. Police showed up and took each of our statements. They examined my son's room. They did a quick scour of the forest outside. It seemed like not a single piece of evidence was found. They had begun to leave when something hanging from high up on a branch caught their eyes. It was a piece of the material. Black. Pinstripe. Much like the suit I bought while I was on vacation. I pointed this out to the police, and they inquired to see my suit. I gladly showed them. When they opened the closet door, what they found was beyond belief. Wrapped in my now-tattered suit was my son. Completely drenched in blood, and he didn't look conscious. Both myself and the police were shocked and disgusted, and... And that's when I blacked out. When I came to, I was in an unfamiliar place. Gray painted walls, small windows on one of them. One exceptionally bland table. And great, I was in an interrogation room. I sat there alone for the good part of an hour before actual human life entered the room with me. And now my memory is a bit hazy at this point, so I'll, I'll try to sum up the conversation as best as I could. The officer said, he said, he said that your son didn't survive. Deepest sympathies to you and your family. You've not been proven guilty, but evidence leans towards it. A further investigation must be held. You have to be brought back home, but you'll be under constant supervision, and so on and so forth. I was driven back home in the back of a police cruiser. Last time I was there was in high school, and vandalism was the cool thing to do. I was welcomed with open arms by my still sobbing wife and my emotionless son. Going back wasn't easy. Well, thankfully, we didn't have to stay long. The police explained that we were going to stay at the hotel for a few days. We gathered our things when a picture from our fridge caught my eye. It was a picture that my, my late son drew. When I saw it, my heart nearly stopped. See, in the, in the cutest crayon drawing you can imagine was my son standing next to a tall, faceless man in a black suit. I made sure no one was around to see me stuff the picture in my pocket. The hotel was what you would normally expect. Simple wallpaper, two twin beds, one TV, cheap, flowery design on everything else. It would have to do since we were stuck there. We settled in, placing out our stuff and lying down. I, on the other hand, I went to the bathroom. The only place I knew was private. I locked the door. I took the picture out of my pocket. I scoured the page for clues. To no avail. All that was there was the crude drawing and his name scribbled into the bottom corner. The thing that unnerved me the most was the fact that the slender man had no face, no, no identity, not a single outstanding feature. It rattled me to the core. But I had enough stress from today. I, I needed sleep. I needed it badly. The night was rough, but I still managed to. 
Not a single dream with the Slender Man either. Then a, a banging came from the door. Being half asleep the whole time, it scared the shit out of me. I turned to my right. 5.14 a.m. That's we're gonna roll. I dragged myself out of bed and very slowly I opened the door. It was a police officer that drove us here. He had a look of panic on his face. He said that my son was missing. Nothing clicked. It took me a minute to wake up and grasp reality again. My son's body was missing. Snatched right from the hospital, but this time I knew where he was. I had to get back to the forest. I had to find the remains of my suit. It was the only way to stop the Slender Man, but I knew it wasn't going to be that easy. I asked the police officer if he could drive me back to my house, th that I had forgotten something. He pondered a moment, and finally he obliged. This time, I had been allowed to sit in the passenger seat. The ride there was quiet. I tried to get some sleep. He didn't, he didn't start any conversations. And when we got there, I was careful to make sure that no one else saw me. I entered the house through the front door and quickly escaped out the back and headed for the forest. It was still very dark out. Traversing the heavily wooded area was not easy. The only light that came through was that of the moon, so I walked almost blind, hoping to find some scrap of my suit. It, it seemed to be impossible until amid the darkness... I saw a scrap of paper. The white of it stood out like a sore thumb. I leaned down to pick it up, and when I turned it around, what I saw completely horrified me. It was another drawing by my son, with both him and the Slender Man. But this one was different. There were three other people, a boy the same height as him, an older-looking girl, and another boy as big as the girl. And it dawned on me, this it was my family. My family, my son drew us in this, in, in with this slender man. And then I saw a beam of light. It was a police officer. I ran up to him and I showed him the picture. I explained that my family is in great danger. And all he told me was there was nothing he could do. He said that, he said that we should go back to the car and we could go to the hotel. A million thoughts ran through my head. Should I concede? Should I resist? What I did next is, is peanuts compared to what was about to unfold. But I didn't know about it looking back and I didn't want to. I gave into the police officer's request. And I began to head back to the car, and while he had his back turned to me, I picked up a fair six stone, and I brought it down on his head. He staggered a bit, and then he fell to the ground, and I took the car keys off of him, and I ran towards the car. It was still dark. I needed to get back to the hotel. I screeched to an immediate halt in the hotel parking lot, and I ran towards the door where they were staying. I swung open the door, and behold, the one thing I was trying to prevent, amidst all the blood that painted the room with three bodies making circles around the Slender Man. He turned and he looked at me, his hollow, non-existent eyes staring deep into me, emotions I'd never felt before, emotions without names filled my brain and body. It was like he was, he was making me feel everything he ever had. And with an outstretched hand, he said only one thing. One thing that would be burned into the back of my mind forever. Help me. Sirens came from behind me. I turned around to see the police cruisers pulling into the parking lot and watching them get out. Using car doors and shields with their guns aimed at me, I raised my hands above my head. I slowly, I slowly looked behind myself to see the Slender Man. Fade away into nothing. Leaving only a tattered suit in a heap on the floor. He killed my family. My life would never be the same, and yet something told me I was never going to see him again. I'd never be able to exact revenge, even if I figured out how. Everything up until the white padded walls isn't exactly clear to me, and I've been told that after they saw me at the hotel with DNA on my suit, I was made the primary suspect. And after they arrested me and subjected me to the frivolous testing, to which they got nothing more than unintangible noises, I was submitted to this place. To the white padded walls. The same white padded walls I see all day, every day. No one will know what happened to me and my family. 
The emotions that were broadcasted to me caused me to lose my ability of speech. And now all I can do is write and draw. And I write out the emotions that the Slenderman felt. I draw the things that he's seen. They would keep me here. I'm a victim of another man's emotion. Sometimes I feel like I've, I've become him. Like we are the same being. That day I learned something. We were slender. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we are celebrating 10 years on YouTube. So, I'm giving these little intros to tell you guys why exactly I chose these stories. Because this series is a series of stories that helped make me who I am over these 10 years. Like I said, they're not necessarily the best stories. <laughs> and I don't want to say that they're the worst either. Because I, these are all stories that are very near and dear to me. And tonight's story, The Disappearance of Ashley, Kansas, is a story that is very dear to me because... It's a story that absolutely spawned me wanting to do reboots. <laughs> I think if you hear the original Disappearance of Ashley Kansas on my channel, I have a slip up less than 10 seconds in. And I don't think I caught it for weeks until after the video came out. I didn't want to remove it. I didn't want to fix it. But I always felt like I wanted to redo it. I wanted to do it better. Because this was... Where there was a back and forth, there was a lot of outside audio, there was a lot of sound effects that I wish I could have done, sound mastering I wish I could have done better. And it's such a great, mysteriously dark story. But for some reason, I um, I don't think I ever actually came back to, to revisit this story or re-record it. So, finally, here's hoping I do it much better than I did the first time. Here is the disappearance of Ashley, Kansas, by an unknown anonymous author. Sometime during the night of August 16, 1952, the small town of Ashley, Kansas ceased to exist. At 3.28 a.m. on August 17, 1952, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake was measured by the U.S. Geological Survey. The earthquake itself was felt throughout the state and most of the Midwest. The epicenter was determined to be directly under Ashley, Kansas. When state law enforcement arrived at what should have been the outskirts of the farming community, they found a smoldering, burning fissure in the earth measuring about a thousand yards in length and approximately 500 yards in width. The depth of the fissure was never determined. After 12 days, the statewide and local search for the missing 679 residents of Ashley, Kansas was called off by the Kansas state government at 9.15 p.m. on the night of August 29, 1952. All 679 residents were assumed to be dead. At 2.27 a.m. on August 30, 1952, a magnitude 7.5 earthquake was measured by the U.S. Geological Survey. The epicenter was situated under what used to be the location of Ashley, Kansas. When law enforcement investigated at 5.32 a.m., they reported that the fissure in the earth had closed. In the eight days leading up to the disappearance of the town and its 679 residents, bizarre and unexplainable events were reported by dozens of residents in Ashley, Kansas, and law enforcement from the surrounding areas. On the evening of August 8, 1952, at 7.13 p.m., a resident by the name of Gabriel Johnson reported a strange sight in the sky above Ashley. The town itself, having no official branch of law enforcement, called into the police station of the neighboring town of Hayes. Gabriel reported what appeared to be a small, black opening in the sky. Within the next 15 minutes, the Hayes police station became overwhelmed with dozens of phone calls, all reporting the same phenomenon. The phenomenon was never reported by any neighboring communities. A decision was made to send a trooper to Ashley to investigate the matter the following morning. At 7.54 a.m. on the morning of August 9th, 
1952, Hayes police officer Alan Mace radioed the Hayes police station. He reported that despite following the one-way road leading into Ashley, he had become lost. According to his report, the road, quote, continued along its normal path, but somehow ended up back in Hayes. Reporter Mace went on to add that the road never curved. It never bent in any direction. At 9.15 a.m., seven of the town's ten police officers were sent to investigate the situation, and all members of the team came to the same conclusion. The only road leading into Ashley stopped leading into Ashley, but instead led back to Hayes. Phone calls continued to pour into the Hayes police station, all reporting that the black opening in the sky continued to grow in size. All callers were advised to remain inside and not travel outside unless absolutely necessary. At 8.17 p.m., Miss Elaine Cantor reported her neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Milton, and their two children, Jeffrey and Brooke, missing. According to Mrs. Cantor's phone call, the Miltons attempted to leave town in their family car earlier in the evening. They never returned. They never returned. Law enforcement officials from Hayes never reported the car or individuals coming up the one-way road. At 7.38 a.m. on the morning of August 10th, 1952, phone calls from Ashley into the Hayes police station reported the town was in total darkness. The sun had never risen. At 10.15 a.m., at the request of Hayes law enforcement, a helicopter from Topeka, Kansas, flew over the region in which Ashley, Kansas, stood. The town was never observed from the air. At 12.43 p.m. on the afternoon of August 11, 1952, Miss Phoebe Danieleski called into the Hayes police station. She reported that her daughter Erica had begun to have conversations with her father, her father who had died three years prior in a drunk driving accident. To add to her concern, Miss Danieleski reported that Erica was attempting to go outside into the dark to, quote, join them. Over the course of the next 12 hours, a reported 329 phone calls were placed into the Hayes police station, all describing similar phenomenon with the children of the town. The following morning of August 12, 1952, the situation became dire. During the middle of the night, all 217 children in the town of Ashley, Kansas, disappeared. A reported 421 phone calls were placed into the Hayes police station. Unable to be of any useful assistance, Hayes law enforcement instructed all callers to remain inside and to avoid any and all attempts at finding the missing children. At 5.19 p.m. on the evening of August 13, 1952, Ashley elderly man Scott Luntz reported a growing, distant fire to the south. According to his description, the fire seemed to turn the distant black into, quote, bright red and orange that seemed to extend high into the sky. Throughout the rest of the day, calls continued in. Stating the fire, in addition to moving north, now seemed to, quote, come out of the black sky. No fire was ever witnessed by any of the neighboring communities or law enforcement officials. The reports continued until 12.09 a.m. on the morning of August 14, 1952. The last phone call placed by a Mr. Benjamin Endicott, reporting that the fire in the sky had grown so intense that it began to appear as daytime over the town. The phone call ended abruptly. Just, just hold on, wait. Yeah. yeah I, I see something. It's to the south. It, it looks like... The next phone call wouldn't be placed until the following evening. The following is the entire transcript of the final phone call to be received by the Hayes Police Department out of the town of Ashley, Kansas. It was placed at 9.46 p.m. on the evening of August 15, 1952. In this recorded phone call, the officer on duty is Officer Peter Welsh. The caller has been identified as Miss April Foster. Hayes Police Department. 
Hello? Yes. Yes, hello? Ma'am, who am I speaking with? My name's April. April Foster. <coughs> please, sir. Please help me. What's happening, ma'am? Last night... Last night they came back. Ma'am, I'm gonna need you to- Last night they came back! Ma'am, I'm gonna need you to calm down and speak clearly. What happened? Who came back? Every, everyone. Everyone. Everyone, ma'am? They all came in the fire. What do you mean, everyone? My son. I, I, I saw my son last night. He was walking. He was walking down the street. He was... He was burned. Jesus Christ, he was burned. Ma'am, I... I... He died last year. I'd raised him since he was a baby. It was just me and him. I told him to watch for cars when he rode his bike, but he... He never, he never wanted he never wanted to listen. Ma'am, what you're saying isn't making any sense. You said everyone came back. Are you fucking listening to me? Everyone! Everyone came back! Everyone who died or went missing, they're, they're back and they're looking for us! He said, he said, Mommy, I'm okay now. See, I can walk again. Where are you, Mommy? I want to see you. Ma'am, where are you now? Are you safe? I'm hiding. I just... It's like everyone else. We saw them coming through the fields and some people opened their doors for them. God, the screaming. I don't know what happened to them, but their houses, they... They caught fire. They caved in. I have my curtains drawn. I'm, I'm hiding in the closet right now. And... Ma'am? Ma'am, is everything alright? Are you okay? Ma'am? Oh my god. Ma'am? So, something just came in. Ma'am, stay as quiet as you can. Don't make a sound. Mommy? Mommy? He came inside. Stay absolutely still. Do not leave. Mommy? Mommy, where are you hiding? Stay quiet. <laughs> I found you! I found you, Mommy! Ma'am? Ma'am? The following morning at 6.55 a.m., the law enforcement officials of the Hayes Police Department arrived at the location of Ashley, Kansas. A smoldering, burning fissure in the earth was all that remained. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and we're celebrating 10 years on YouTube. As of January 4th, 2021, it has been 10 years on the platform as Mr. Creepypasta. Tonight's story is one that I I have to talk about, honestly. This is, this is very much something that helped me start creating characters, or really trying to act more on my videos than um, trying to just flat narrate. There's a lot of characters and character voices and characters I try to portray, at least in an emotional way, that I feel like stemmed from here to go on to be the characters that I play in Baraska or the characters I play in Tales from the Gas Station or many other other stories and series that you can possibly see on the channel. This was the first time that I ever tried to play a character who had gone completely crazy, who was emotionally broken. And I believe this is, I went way, way over the top in the original, uh, but I want to be able to revisit it and, and really try to hit those notes the way that I feel like they're supposed to be. And plus, I mean, it's a creepypasta monster that we all know and love. So this is Sacrifice by an unknown anonymous author. April 25th, 2011. I awoke abruptly, sweat dripping from my brow. I could feel his presence. I looked around my room. I know I'm being watched. It's not... It's not anywhere to be seen. Damn. It's the third night in a row I've been awoken like this. The fear is starting to take over my mind. Something out there is stalking me. Something wants me. But I should back up and I should tell this from the beginning, right? Right. 
I'm 16 years old. I moved into this house with my family seven years ago. It's about 30 minutes outside of town, so, so we're fairly isolated. My parents love living out here. They say it's peaceful, it's pretty, and, well, I hate it. Not as much during the day as during the night. I've always been scared of the dark. You know, it's my, it's my number one phobia. I hate not being able to see. And out here at night, there's no light other than the moon and the stars. No warm, comforting glow of street lamps. No headlights slowly moving up and down the street. Just, just a hazy darkness. And it's especially dark during a new moon. And that's when I first encountered it. A thing. I had a bunch of friends over, and after dark, we all decided to play some airsoft catch of the flag. So it was a new moon, which made it especially dark and creepy. No light pierced the inky blackness except for the flashlights on the barrels of our airsoft pistols, and the occasional zip of glow-in-the-dark airsoft pellets flying at their targets. We were all having a great time. <laughs> I grabbed the other team's flag, I was rushing back to my base, and I heard a sound that made my blood run cold. A scream of terror, coming from about 30 feet to my right. A flash of white was running away from the sound. I changed directions, I rushed towards the noise, aiming my flashlight at the source of the sound. My friend Jacob was sitting in the dirt, holding his bleeding leg, obviously in pain. The cut was deep. Another friend, Matt, and I rushed him inside. And we sat on the edge of the bathtub and began to wash and dress the cut. We asked him what had happened. Some creature had scratched him, he said. He didn't get a good look at it, but just saw a flash of white. At first, I assumed it was just a possum or something. And that's when I saw it again. The second time, I was alone. It was the middle of the night, not a new moon, thankfully, but still eerie. I had insomnia, a rather common problem for me, and it was 2 a.m. I'd given up all hope of getting any sleep, so I went downstairs to the living room, and I popped in a DVD, and as I lay on the couch, my mind lost in the world of Inception, one of my dogs started barking. I thought nothing of it. Barking in the middle of the night is basically a routine for them. Then my other dog joined in. No big deal. But I noticed something. This bark was more menacing than usual. It was more more of a guttural, growling bark. The bark dogs make when they're threatened. You know, I, I turned on the back porch light, and I stepped outside, creeped out. I called for them. Jake, Zoe, come here! Then I saw what they were barking at. It looked like a... like a human crouched there in the grass. It was probably about four feet tall with bare, pale skin and long, bony limbs. I studied it for about five seconds and it stared back at me. And I'll never forget its eyes. It was dark, almost like, like empty sockets. Its cold gaze washed over me as if it was, it was sizing me up and then it slowly started to move towards me. I was almost paralyzed by fear, but I was able to get back into the house. I locked the door behind me and I rushed to my parents' room. They were convinced I had a nightmare. But I... I know the truth, right? That, that was the first time I had fully seen the creature. The creature that would bring me to the brink of insanity. I didn't see that thing again for quite some time. I, I started to think that maybe my parents were right. It was just a dream. I was really sleep deprived after all, but deep down inside, I knew I knew I had seen something. But a few weeks ago, I was on some website my friend Derek had recommended, and I saw a picture that shocked me. It was a creature, the one that I had seen. The, the website called this creature... The Rake. And that it stalks and mauls its victim. The moment I saw the article, my blood ran cold. And could I have seen this creature? The thought haunted me, refusing to leave my mind. I saw it again for the first time in months last week. I had just woken up in the middle of the night again. Immediately, I felt that something was wrong. You know, the, the house was too quiet. I felt very unsettled. I got out of bed, I walked to the window, and I raised the blinds, and... 
It was, it was very dark outside, but I could make something out. The creature was outside, scratching at something on the ground. Immediately, I opened the window. I yelled at the thing. It looked up at me. It caught my eyes for a moment. And then it rushed off, crawling on all fours very close to the ground. And when I went out to see what it was scratching at the next morning, I found something that still chills me to the bone. The mangled, half-eaten corpse of my dog, Zoe. My parents think it was a mountain lion, but I know the truth. The so-called... Rake. That bastard creature. It killed my dog. The last few nights have been terrifying. I've woken up in a cold sweat each night. Knowing that damn thing's watching me, I... I feel its presence. I know it wants me now, and I have no idea what to do. I'm terrified. I'm terrified beyond belief, and I'm helpless. My parents keep telling me I'm imagining things, but I'm not, damn it. I know, I know what I've seen. I know that it wants me. That's, that's why I'm writing this down at three in the morning. If anything happens to me, if anything happens, I want people to know. And I'll update as soon as something else happens. May 2nd. 2011. The last week was a whirlwind of terror. I'm constantly in fear now. I know it's always watching me around, around every corner, everywhere I go. Every night, I feel its presence. And some nights more than others. I don't know exactly what it wants from me, but I know it wants something. I saw it again. For the first time in a week today. I stayed home sick. I still feel like shit. I think it makes... It, it makes me sick. I was laying on the couch watching TV, constantly looking over my shoulders because I know he's always watching me. I have a shotgun at my side. A benefit of living in the country. Got it from the garage. It's loaded in case this thing, which I've decided to call the rake, tries to attack. I knew it would soon. I heard a noise outside and I cocked my gun. I stepped, I stepped outside to investigate. Nothing. Damn it. I tried to patrol the perimeter of the house just in case. I walked all the way around. Nothing. I stepped back inside. And that's when the smell hit me. It was the stench of death. Rotting. I held the gun out in front of me, slowly made my way up the stairs, and turned the corner to my room. It was crouched in the corner, facing away from me. It slowly tilted its head towards me. And then it spoke. It spoke in its high, shrill voice. I'm not sure exactly what it said to me. But I didn't hesitate to pull the trigger. But it moved at almost superhuman speed and barreled into me, knocking me down. I saw it jump off our second floor balcony into the living room floor, charged out the door. My arm was bleeding bad, so I grabbed the shirt and I pushed it to my arm to try to stop the blood. I rushed outside, the gun still in my hand. It was, it was gone. Go to hell, I screamed. I stepped back inside and I saw the blood. It wasn't my blood, it was, it was its blood. I grabbed the dog it hadn't killed, Jake. I put his nose to the blood, he picked up the scent and started moving towards the woods near my house. I didn't think twice and I followed. We rushed through the woods and a mile away from the house, Jake started to whimper. I sent him back. See, this was, this was my job. I started to explore the area, my finger twitching on the trigger, terrified. And after about a half hour of searching, I saw something weird. A small area of ground that was different. It seemed covered up. I, I walked over and I swept away the grass and I was, I was right. There was a board under the grass. I, I pulled the board. I exposed a hole. A, a rusty ladder led down against all better judgment. Curiosity got the better of me. I slung the shotgun over my back and I lowered myself down. I was in a tunnel. It wasn't well lit, a few candles, but it was lit enough to see the blood smeared walls. The smell, oh, the smell was awful. I could see paintings in the blood, disturbing things. 
Stuff I never wanted to see. I, I walked through the tunnel towards the source of more light. I could see a sort of room. When I stepped in, I wanted to throw up. There were... There were animal parts all over the floors and on the walls and there must have there must have been this must have been its feeding room i turn around retching and and there it stood there it stood right there behind me it reached toward me and i blacked out i woke up in my room about 30 minutes ago now no cut on my arm no no blood anywhere. I decided to write everything while it's still fresh in my mind. My parents still aren't home. It's dark outside. I'm terrified to leave my room now. I mean... Maybe it didn't happen at all. Maybe I'm going insane. Paranoia is here to stay. I realized what the rake said in my room when he talked to me. It wants sacrifice. Mom and Dad, if you read this after I'm gone, then, then get the hell away. I don't know where to, but just, just leave. Leave this place. May 7th, 2011. It's over now. It's over, he's satisfied. The sacrifice was made. And I'm alone. He was... He was with me three... Three, three nights. He, he just stands next to my bed. He watches me and sometimes he'll whisper to me. He told me, he told me he wanted sacrifice. Bloody sacrifice. He said I had to do it. And I knew that he was right. They don't matter to me. I can be alone. I My parents thought I was going crazy, and little do they know. Little do they know. So last night I told him I... I told him I'd do it. I'd give him a sacrifice. A good, good sacrifice so he'll be happy. I told him... I told him to come with me. I wanted to show them a pretty spot that I had found. They walked with me. They walked to the rake hall. They... I opened it up. I pulled out a gun. I'd... I told them to get into it. They asked what I was doing. I... I told them that he wanted to see them. And they went in the hall and we, we walked through the tunnel and she was, she was crying. And then Mr. Rake came out of his hiding place and he looked at me and he had his black eyes and he smiled and then he... And then they... He killed them. He killed them. They screamed a little bit. I didn't care. He was happy now. He pointed at the hole and I knew it was time to leave. I knew it was time to leave and they... I'm back home now and I'm all alone. In my dark room, I'm not scared of the dark anymore. I, I like the dark. It reminds me of my friend the rake. I'm okay. I'm... I'm okay. I'm okay. Damn it, damn it, I'm not okay. I just led my parents to their deaths. I'm crazy. I, I have the gun with me now and I'm... I'm gonna pull the trigger. I looked across my room and he's crouching there. He's smiling at me and he's crouching there and he's telling me to do it. He's still hungry. He... he he wants one more sacrifice. One more sacrifice. And I'm, I'm gonna give it to him. I'm going... Goodbye. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I'm celebrating 10 years on YouTube. It's been 10 years since January 4th in 2011 to January 4th in 2021. So if there's one thing I feel like that is most ingrained into what the creepypasta genre is, even more so than like creepypasta monsters, 
I'd say it's actually ritual pastas. I I feel like creepy pasta stories stemmed from chain emails way 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 back when that used to tell stories about you dying by a girl who watches your bed unless you send this letter to ten different people, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, obviously we've come a long way since then, and now there's plots and characters and everything of the like. And this is not my first ritual pasta. And in fact, I wouldn't even say it's my favorite, uh, because my views are very skewed when it comes down to what my favorites are in my channel. But this is one I do feel like really expresses where ritual pastas come from and where ritual pastas have gone to. And I actually left that up to you guys to help me decide uh, if we should have gone with the cell phone game or if we go with the devil game. And by your decisions, you seem to have chosen the devil game, which I have to admit is a very, very good story. So for tonight, a story that helped make me who I am is the devil game by Infernal Nightmare 333. Pray for the devil. Pray. For devils have no reason. Satan waits to curse your ways. Have you seen it in his eyes in the sunset? Have you wondered if he's laughing when he plays? Kansas. The Devil Game. This is a set of instructions for how to speak with the devil. Which, as those of you with any sort of brains at all might note, is a patently moronic proposition on the face of it. One likely to culminate in any number of thoroughly unpleasant fates. Honestly, it would probably be smarter to publish your credit card number on Facebook, or take up a career in crocodile wrestling. But then, that isn't going to stop you, is it? Not if you're sincerely interested, at least. I mean, technically, if you do everything just right, there's a fair chance that you'll walk away scot-free. And that seems to be reason enough for some people to decide that it's a good idea, especially if you're the fate-tempting, thrill-seeking, scare junkie type. Or the desperate type. Which brings me to a point of clarification that I ought to make. This is not a manual for making any kind of Faustian bargain. You know, the, the whole sell your soul type of deal. Although if you happen to bring it up in conversation, you probably wouldn't refuse one. Following through with such a foolhardy bargain, however, would necessitate removing some of the protections which you'll put in place for your conversation. And I don't think I need to spell out to you why that would be a bad idea. I mean, if you're really mathematically impaired enough to want to trade something that will last an infinite number of years for something that will last about 90 tops, there are plenty of other rituals out there for you to follow. This one, if performed correctly, should only allow the two of you to talk. And this perhaps begs the question of why exactly you would want to speak with the devil in the first place. I mean, maybe some of you just like the idea of making small talk with extremely dangerous occult entities. But for the sake of the human race, I hope most of you aren't quite that stupid. Short answer is, he knows things. Things that some of you may have a deep, vested interest in finding out. I mean, he's not omniscient or anything, much as he might like to pretend otherwise. He's not God. But he's definitely got a supernatural advantage over the kind of knowledge any human would be able to obtain. I mean, for example, he probably wouldn't be able to predict when the next world war will happen, or tell you the cure for cancer, but he could very well be able to predict the winning numbers of, say, tomorrow's $100 million Powerball drawing, or tell you what deadly undiagnosed condition might be afflicting one of your loved ones. Of course, the Prince of Darkness doesn't just go around giving out winning lottery numbers to anyone who asks. And trusting any sort of information obtained from a being commonly described as the father of all lies is liable to land you in a worse situation than you were in when you started. However, well, if you're really dead set on finding something out and you've exhausted all other options, there is a way to get accurate information out of the guy. You see, like so many of the more urbane villains in popular culture, the devil has a bit of a penchant for games and gambling. Of course, the reason he likes them so much is that he almost always wins. 
unless you happen to be a fiddler named Johnny, or you're being represented by Daniel Webster, then you're probably going to get your ass handed to you. But if you're determined enough to want to face the risks and the long odds, there's a certain game the two of you can play to try to win the information you need. Now, first things first. We'll start off with a description of the summoning process. Then, we'll get into the rules of the game, some tips for how to play. And finally, of course, the inevitable litany of arcane shit that might go horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> In order to contact your conversational partner, you'll need to go to church at midnight. It doesn't matter what kind of church... Large or small, old or new, liberal or conservative, just as long as you are sure that it will be empty. last thing you want is for some preacher to walk in on you while you're in the middle of this. For the sake of the preacher's well-being, as well as for your own. The process will probably work best if you try to do it on a new moon or a full moon. Though we're Friday the 13th. Or Halloween. The actual day is less important than the psychological effect it has on you. As long as you don't try it on Christmas Eve or something stupid like that, you should be fine. The time, however, is important. You don't have to start or end your ritual at exactly 12 a.m., Greenwich Atomic Time or anything, but as a general rule of thumb, you ought to show up a bit before midnight. Have everything set up no later than 10 or 15 minutes after. Show up a lot before midnight if you don't know how you're going to get in. And shockingly enough, most houses of God tend to lock their doors at night. At least, if no one's there to watch over them. And remember... We want empty. Got it? There are, of course, certain things that you need to bring, and certain things that you can't bring. For this ritual, you will need a full can of salt. You won't need to use it all, but it's always better to have more than you need than to have less. Seven candles, red or white being preferable. Something to light the candles with. You'd be shocked how often people forget this. A cult ritual or not, they aren't going to magically light themselves. A length of red string, rope, yarn, or thread. A full-length floor or wall mirror. Ideally, you'll want to find one of those already present in the church. They're a bit unwieldy to be lugging around when you're trying to break in. However, if there really aren't any there, you'll have to bring your own. You might also find it useful to bring some markers, pencils, paper, a flashlight, and any sort of tools that might be necessary to secure your entrance into the church. You will not be permitted to bring any electronic or timekeeping devices. This includes all cell phones, smartphones, tablets, e-readers, mp3 players, PDAs, calculators, wristwatches, pocket watches, kitchen timers, hourglasses, etc., etc., etc. Seriously, it's worse than the SAT. If you're one of those people that has your smartphone practically wired into your brain, don't worry, you can bring those things with you to the church as long as you leave them outside of the room in which you will be doing the ritual. If you brought a flashlight, helpful for finding your way around without attracting unwanted attention, leave that outside as well. Also, don't bring any sort of religious paraphernalia in to protect you, especially if it pertains to the Abrahamic religions, and yes, if if those gothy black cross earrings you're wearing are hanging right side up, they count. If you have any kind of holy symbols like that with you, the devil will simply refuse to show up. Don't worry. You're not going to be totally unprotected. In fact, most of the supplies with you are not for any sort of devil summoning ritual, but they're for your own protection. Old superstitions and folk magic remedies to guard oneself from evil. From what I know of, the effects mostly based on the power of belief. So there are probably numerous other objects, artifacts, and procedures that would work just as well. If you'd like to risk being left helpless at the mercy of the devil in order to test this theory, then feel free to experiment. However, for anyone without a psychotic death wish, I'd recommend sticking to the ritual as follows. Once you're sure you have all the right supplies with you, make your way into the church and find some place to set up. It can be anywhere from the main sanctuary where services are held, to a Sunday school classroom, to a walk-in supply closet. As long as you have a sufficient amount of open floor space, and you're certain not to be disturbed. Set up your mirror first. This is where the devil will appear when you summon him. As such, you mustn't complete the ritual until you've laid down certain wards around it. First, 
surround the mirror with an unbroken circle of salt. If the mirror is hanging on a wall or floor, lay down a semicircle around it instead, and make sure the salt touches the wall at both ends. Then wrap your red string around the mirror several times. The color red, especially red string, is symbolic of protection in the folklore of many cultures and religions. This is also why red candles are a relatively good idea. Speaking of the candles, set them up around the outside of your circle or semicircle of salt, spaced at relatively even intervals. No, you don't have to get out measuring tape and make it exactly perfect, but do at least try to make it look as though it was set up by someone old enough to be trusted with matches. Light the candles in a clockwise fashion, being careful not to disturb the salt. If you break the circle, you have to start all over again, and once all the candles are lit and burning strongly, your protective wards are complete. You are now ready to proceed to the actual summoning. To do so, you must first get the devil's attention and demonstrate your resolve by performing some sort of sacrilegious act in the holy space. Turning a crucifix or a cross upside down is fairly conventional. I mean, for example, I know of a kid who once fulfilled this requirement by scribbling obnoxious graffiti all over a painting of Jesus hanging on his Sunday school classroom. The nice thing about turning a cross upside down is that once you've finished your encounter, assuming you've survived it in one piece, you can just flip it right side up again, and no one's the wiser. Sidestepping the relatively minor but still irritating risk of having your Sunday school turned into a reenactment of the Spanish Inquisition for the next month and a half. After you finish doing whatever offensive thing you've decided on, shut all the doors in the room and turn off all the lights, so that the space is lit only by candles. Face the mirror and stare deeply into it, concentrating on your desired outcome. There's no incantations, there's no arcane strings of Latin that you have to recite, just... Look in the mirror and wish as hard as you can for the devil to appear there. And for a few moments of this, when you feel ready, close your eyes, count to ten, and then open them. If all's gone correctly, you'll no longer see your own reflection. You'll be looking at the devil, or at least looking at the way the devil has chosen to appear to you. Chances are, he won't look like your conventional red horn demon with goat legs and a pitchfork, nor any other sort of terrible apparition. No point in scaring you off now, I mean, better to lure you in, make you feel safe. To the end, he generally takes on the appearance of a fairly average, nondescript human being. If anything, he's prone to vanity, and will lean towards the more attractive end of the spectrum. The only real frightening part of him will be his eyes. No matter how hard he tries, he can't hide the sinister gleam smoldering deep within them. The malevolent amusement, the hunger, like the, like the eyes of a spider contemplating a fly struggling in its web. They're supremely confident, those eyes. Confident without pity. Don't look into them too deeply or you'll begin to feel helpless, paralyzed with dread, losing your hope. And you're willing to fight, and since you'll, you'll probably be standing there, staring at him in shock for a few moments, having on some level expected for the ritual to fail, he'll initiate the conversation by asking you what you desire from him. If you can gather your wits enough to string together a coherent sentence, you should respond with something like, uh, I wish to challenge you in a game of question and response. And even if you don't get the words exactly right, he'll know what you mean. And he'll accept your request with a wide predatory grin of anticipation. He's been playing this game for a long time, you see, and he's very good at it. Most humans, on the other hand, are very bad at it. This gives him a chance to, at the very least, thoroughly mess with your mind, and at most, well, we'll save that for the litany of shit that could go wrong. You're, you'll probably play it very smart to avoid justifying his expectations. The general rule to the game is very simple, with a few caveats that can make things more complicated. He'll begin asking you a question. He always initiates the game. It could be anything from a piece of obscure trivia to a riddle, to an extremely personal inquiry. Now don't worry, you won't be immediately plunged into hell if you get the wrong answer or anything like that. As a matter of fact, 
He won't even tell you whether you got the answer right or wrong. After you've answered his question, you get to ask him one in return. Now, here's where the consequences of your response come in. If you answered his last question correctly, he'll respond to your question as honestly and accurately as he possibly can. However, if you answered it incorrectly, well, he's free to lie to you as he sees fit. Perhaps if you asked him something you're better off not knowing, he'll tell you the truth about it anyway. More likely, he'll feed you the most insidious, damaging lie he can come up with. Either way, after he's responded, he'll ask you another question. And the process will repeat, over and over, until you decide to call it quits. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, that sounds fairly easy to get the information you need. All you need to do is wait for a question that you can answer correctly, and then take this opportunity to ask him what he really wants to know, ignoring everything else that he said. Well, it's not that simple. See, the devil will never give you an easy question, one that you can completely be sure of the answer to. He may instead give you questions that you have some vague knowledge of, that you think maybe you know the answer to, but aren't really confident. Thus forcing you to endlessly second-guess yourself, obsessing over whether or not you can trust the information that he gave you next. And perhaps you'll think that what he said was a lie, I mean, wish it was a lie, but be eternally consumed by doubt, unable to fully convince yourself that you're wrong. Or perhaps you have to make a huge choice based on the information that he gave you, and be tormented by fear and indecisiveness, as you realize that your fate, perhaps that of the others as well, rests entirely upon whether or not you're able to correctly recall some arcane piece of trivia you don't even remember now. You'll never remember the exact questions the devil asked you, by the way. That would make it too easy for you to go and check on your responses. Or maybe instead of testing your knowledge, he'll ask you something personal. Something you even lie to yourself about. You answer back to him, thinking you've gotten the question correct. No, I don't resent my sister. Yes, I will return the money to the police. But he'll know better. He'll know better than you do that you're lying. And he'll lie to you in return, and you'll believe him. You'll believe him until you no longer are able to deceive yourself, and by then... By then it might be too late. Or maybe... Maybe he won't even give you a chance to get an accurate response at all. Maybe he'll just ask you endless strings of completely impossible questions, making you more and more frustrated and disheartened as you realize you'll never be able to force him to tell you the truth. Questions like, what was the exact height of Mount Everest in centimeters in the year of 1666? Or, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Although knowing his sense of humor, if he asked the latter, he might consider African or European a correct response. There are a couple of ways to short-circuit this particular strategy, however, additional rules and, of course, action that make this game more interesting and prevent you from being stonewalled completely. Although, in all honesty, he probably wants you to try one of those options anyway. The first option is to ask him a riddle instead of a question. If you somehow manage to stump him and he answers the riddle wrong, or gives up, he'll be obliged to give you a truthful response to your next question. If he answers the riddle correctly, once again, don't worry, he won't pounce on you like a sphinx or drag you to hell. What will happen is that he will get a pass, allowing him to lie in response to one question he would otherwise be obligated to answer truthfully. Honestly, if he gets a pass, you might as well just give up and quit the game right there. It's nearly impossible to determine when he's telling the truth under the best of conditions, adding another layer of complexity by constantly trying to figure out when and if he's used his past is about enough to make any normal person's brain explode. There's no way. Just forget it. The second option is for you to take a dare from him. You accept it and vow to follow through, then once again, he'll have to answer your next question truthfully. If you choose instead to reject it, you'll get another pass. Now, before you freak out and reject the whole idea completely, you should know that he won't ask you to do anything overly dramatic or unspeakably evil, like blow up a hospital, murder somebody. As a rule of thumb, most dares won't involve direct loss of life or major felonies. However, they certainly won't be easy. Inflicting severe pain on yourself, 
doing something that terrifies the shit out of you, cutting off a treasured relationship, publicly humiliating yourself or someone you love. All these things and more, things you might not be able to imagine, are completely on the table. If you're willing to go that far, to put yourself in that kind of position, you'll get your answer. However, if you manage to come up with one thing you know you simply can't or won't do, well then once again, you might as well just quit. One last thing. Don't think you can just tell him you're going to do something and then not do it. If you accept a dare and then don't follow through with it, well, let's just say there will be consequences. Just suck it up. Keep your promise, no matter what it is. Trust me, you're better off that way. And finally, when you've either gotten the information you wanted or given up on it completely, you may end the ritual by simply thanking the devil for accepting your request, bowing politely at the waist, and bidding him farewell. The surface of the mirror will seem to swim and flicker for a moment, and then... Then you'll be looking at your own reflection again. Only when you're absolutely certain that you're looking into your own two eyes again may you turn away from the mirror, flick the lights back on, and begin dismantling your protections. Now, and, and this is important, even if you haven't gotten the information that you wanted, you must end the ritual in this manner before 66 minutes have elapsed. See, well, I suppose that technically you have 66 minutes and 6 seconds. It's subtle, right? But if you're seriously going to try to cut it that close without any kind of timekeeping, well, you're probably screwed anyway. I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you keep to this time limit. Now, I'll save the reason behind that for the end, but don't skip ahead. I still got a few important tips on how to play. Number one, be very careful what sort of personal information you give out. Try not to talk about yourself, especially your emotions and your problems, any more than absolutely necessary. See, this guy knows human psychology like the back of his hand, and he will get inside your head. It's like, it's like talking to Hannibal Lecter. Give him enough to work with, and even if you don't believe a single word he says, he will still find ways to fuck with your mind like nobody's business. If anything he asks makes you even remotely uncomfortable, do not hesitate to lie through your teeth. There will be plenty of other questions. Number two. On a similar note, try to keep the game on track and move briskly. Unstructured interactions of any kind are to be avoided. Chances are that at some point he will try to draw you off on a tangent, discussing something that fascinates you, analyzing response you've given him, or finding some other excuse to speak at length without, um, without moving the game forward. This is not only a waste of valuable time, but also another excellent opportunity to mess with your mind. Number three, if you choose to give them a riddle, use one you've made up yourself. If, you, if your riddle has ever been written down anywhere at all, from the pages of The Hobbit to some long lost tome of ancient magic, you will already know the answer. That said, it has to be a legitimate riddle with an answer that makes logical sense from some angle. You can't just ask something like, What's green has ten legs and hops? And then claim for some inexplicable reason that the answer was marshmallows. Nor can you ask him a straight question like, What have I got in my pocket? He probably knows that anyway. There is no hard and fast rules to determine whether a riddle makes sense or not, but you're a reasonable human being. Your ancestors ate from the tree of knowledge. Please, for the love of crap, use common sense. Number four, if you choose to take a dare, there is a slight chance that the devil will ask you to do something seemingly easy. Deliver a letter, for instance, or scribble a ten-digit number in a public restroom stall. If he does ask you for something like this and you have even a shred of common decency in you, do not accept Chances are that he's using you to further some sinister plot, one liable to ruin a lot of lives and harm a lot of people. Who knows? Maybe you're the type of person who really doesn't mind throwing in an unknown number of total strangers under a bus to find out what you want to know, but at least be aware that that is what you're doing. And number five, 
Last but not least, be very aware of the time. It might be helpful to do some practicing beforehand, get a feel for how long an hour is without a watch. The devil will probably put off discussing things you're most keen to find out for as long as he can, and as you're near the 66 minute deadline, he'll start to try harder and harder to distract you, captivate you, otherwise keep you playing until it's too late. He'll string you along, feed you little glimmers of hope, keep you thinking. Just a few more minutes. I'm almost there. Don't fall for it. Don't go over the time limit. No matter what. Now, you might be thinking that this game really doesn't sound all that dangerous so far. I mean, threats of, of psychological damage rarely seem to carry the same weight as threats of physical damage, even though their costs are often just as great. Hate to burst your bubble. But the game is far from safe. There are plenty of ways for you to seriously screw yourself over, both physically and mentally, not to mention spiritually. And it is with these that I will conclude, in the vain hope that they may make some sort of impression. See, first, while you're speaking with the devil, do not let him out of your sight. Keep staring into the mirror no matter what happens. He'll undoubtedly try various tricks to make you look away. You'll hear noises behind you. You'll feel eyes in the back of your neck. See shadowy phantoms writhing in the depths of the mirror. A cold breath will blow upon you from behind, smelling like the crypt. A deep silence will settle, only to be interrupted by a loud smack directly behind your head, giving you about the worst jump scare you've ever had. And hell, the devil may even abandon a measure of his own dignified facade and give a sudden jump of feigned shock, shouting loudly and pointing behind you with a very convincing look of terror on his face. Whatever he may test you with, you must not look away from him. If you look away, if you lose sight of him completely, even for one second, you will look back at the mirror to find him gone. Well, not gone. Out of the mirror. In the room. With you. Exactly how much of your body the police will find the next morning, and what state it's in, will depend entirely on the sort of mood he's in. The same goes for if you break any of the protections he laid down before beginning the ritual, interrupting the circle of salt, letting the red string unwind, knocking over a candle or letting one go out. Any of these things will free him from the mirror, and then? And then? Well, you're a bunch of creative horror junkies. I'm sure you can fill in the blanks. On a different topic, you may reach a point in the game, probably after a long series of maddening impossible questions, where the devil asks you, the descriptively simple question. What's your full name? You must not give it to him. Names can be things of great power. Although the devil will, of course, already know your name, telling it to him yourself is akin to inviting a vampire into your home. Your name is deeply synonymous with your own inner self. Thus, giving him your name is a powerful symbol of giving him yourself. If you're foolish enough to make this mistake, all your protections will be for naught, and he will seize upon your unwitting offer with malice glee. Stealing away your soul, dragging it back with him to hell. At least this way the police will find a complete, unidentifiable body. As a matter of fact, your vacant shell will be totally unblemished, seemingly having dropped dead of sheer terror. And last, but certainly not least, there's the matter of what happens if you go over the time limit. I mean, this is arguably the worst thing you can do. You won't think so at first. The devil will give you no indication that you have, in fact, exceeded the time limit, and you will conclude the ritual as if nothing had gone wrong. Perhaps the devil's image in the mirror trembles and gives way, and you'll see a particularly nasty, triumphant smirk flashed across his face. But this will be easily dismissed as your imagination. So you'll turn the lights back on, you'll gather your belongings, and you'll go to leave the room. But when you open the door, you'll see nothing. <laughs> That's right, nothing. Just a flat, white void extending infinitely in all directions. Only the room which was reflected in the mirror will now exist. Incidentally, if you turn back around to face the mirror again, you might catch the last glimpse of your own reflection. Perhaps, perhaps you'll even turn 
and favor you with a smirk and a cheeky wave before sweeping out the door into the perfectly normal church hallway outside. As you may have already figured out, you yourself are no longer in the church. Your soul is now trapped in the mirror, and the devil has taken the liberty of possessing your body, now that you're no longer using it. Pound on the glass. Scream, if you like. You'll never get out on your own, and no exorcist can help you. But don't worry. It's not like you're in hell, right? At least not necessarily. What you have to understand, see, is that a human soul, stripped bare of its flesh, is a deeply volatile and vulnerable thing. Especially when trapped in the land of the living. You're now an entity of pure mental properties, and as such the barriers between what is real to you and what is imaginary have been completely dissolved. As you fill that reflected room with your anger, your sorrow, your fear at being trapped, these emotions will begin to coalesce, given form by your mind, and if you're not particularly imaginative, these creatures may not be too terrible, <laughs> maybe not be able to inflict too much horror and pain. With time, you may even be able to teach yourself to get rid of them. If, however, yours is a mind haunted by monsters, a mind that is vibrantly creative and imaginative and more than usually twisted. Well, there's no telling what horrors might come clawing their way out of the maelstrom, tasting sweet release from the confines of your subconscious, hungering for your terror and your suffering, and they will refuse to be banished, dragging you, kicking and screaming into an endless, positive feedback loop of pain and fear. Needless to say, if you're a regular patron of websites like this one, well, they're probably pretty well fucked. There's only one way to find release from the mirror and the world that you've created therein. They say if you call the devil once more and ask him to free you from the mirror, he'll be willing to take you out. For a fee, of course. Who knows? Maybe if your imagination is twisted and powerful enough to create a personal hell that leaves you begging for the real thing, those talents might be put to good use. There are over 7 billion people in the world, after all, and even the devil himself can't be messing with all their minds at once. Talented help is always appreciated. Of course, the corollary to you being trapped inside the mirror is that the devil will now get to do whatever he wants in your body until sunrise. Around that time, your body will mercifully drop dead from the strain of the possession. Autopsy will probably identify the cause as some kind of coronary event. Oh, don't get too relieved, though. See, he's perfectly capable of stirring up plenty of trouble in those few hours. For instance, he may decide to do something big and dramatic, like purchase a large meat cleaver, go on a murder spree, starting with the names in your address book and working his way to complete strangers if he has time. Or perhaps he'll focus on only one person. Someone who trusts you completely. Using your persona to get him or her alone and vulnerable and then... Well, no need to describe it here. Once again, I'm sure you can think of a few things. Starting to see why this is the worst outcome yet? Of course, there is always a chance that he won't lay a finger on any of your loved ones. Instead, deciding to do something a little more subtle. More insidious, like drop off a few nondescript, unmarked packages on certain doorsteps in the dangerous part of town, or or to locate a particular dusty, aged, yellow text in the storeroom of your local library and intentionally misfile it in the young adult literature section, or, or whisper seven very choice words in the ear of the distracted-looking young redhead waiting for the 3 a.m. subway train. Or maybe he'll decide that in this age of waning superstition, not enough people are getting themselves interested in his games, and the knowledge of them is in danger of being lost. Maybe he'll decide that he needs to get the word out a bit more. Do a bit of networking. Attract some new sucker <coughs> challengers. Maybe he'll take a quick peek at your browser history. See where the impressionable, curious minds are hanging out these days. Maybe he'll even write a quick tutorial in modern parlance rather than some inscrutable, obsolete demonological text. Maybe he'll post it to the internet. See how many bites he gets. 
I mean, maybe, maybe I really shouldn't have gone there. Maybe you've already made it this far without shying a little twist at the end. Maybe it's not going to pull you off, is it? I'm sure there's plenty of intrepid adventurers amongst you with burning questions you'd like answered. And you're all a very smart bunch. You know the pitfalls, you know the conventions, you live and breathe this sort of thing, don't you? There's no way you'd fall into any of the obvious traps, right? I mean, you're not some Dick or Jane off the street, after all. You'd be bringing a whole new level of competition, wouldn't you? Excuse me for just a moment. I think someone calling me. Do you want out that badly? Already? Must be a hell of an imagination you got on you. Perfect. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Kavi Pasta, and we are at the end of the series. Well, almost at the end. I got one more little surprise for you guys that many, 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 many of you have been asking for. Tonight's story is one that I do think is probably one of the better ones that I've recorded, and it is definitely, I guess, part of a set of stories that has made me who I am. A favor for a favor, and uh, quite honestly, Vincent Manacapa, or Vincent V. Cava, should I say, is a big part of who I am on YouTube today. He's the first author I really started getting to know and becoming friends with and very good friends with today and honestly he's opened up a lot of doors for me in doing this. The first audiobooks I ever did was Decomposing Head by Vincent Vicava and I've continued to work with him and he's written for the channel, written exclusives for the channel and I feel like it's changed what the channel is from recording stories at creepasta.com to working with authors, promoing books from authors on no sleep to authors all over the internet so my final story for the 10 year anniversary celebration is going to be my uh first time re-recording favor for a favor and i have to thank you all for getting me here and letting me do this for 10 years because uh i don't know what else i'd be doing if i wasn't here so thank you and this is a Favor for a Favor by Vincent V. Cava. It must have been the most run-down, filth-ridden motel I'd ever seen. The kind of place where cockroaches didn't feel the need to scatter at the flash of a light bulb. I wouldn't be surprised if a whole civilization of the nasty things were living between the walls, laying their repulsive egg sacs wherever they pleased, and multiplying faster than an Asian kid on Adderall. I was seated at the edge of the bed, shifting uncomfortably atop its warped mattress, while trying to ignore the rank funk radiating from a pile of unwashed sheets bundled up in the corner. It was the type of room people did everything but sleep in. That was fine by me. I didn't come there for shut-eye anyway. In my left hand was a half-drunk bottle of Jack Daniels, in my right was a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson. The extraordinarily depressing location was poetically fitting in a way. I was extraordinarily depressed after all. It was, it was my wife who was the cause of my misery. She'd broken my heart, leaving me with nothing but a vacant, grief-stricken soul. Like a teenager who listens to Fall Out Boy and writes poetry on Tumblr. For a while, suspicions of infidelity had loomed over our marriage but I had always chalked up my conjectures as nothing more than a paranoid delusion. They say denial is the best remedy for heartache. It wasn't until I stumbled across a series of implicitly sexual emails between her and the pastor of our church, a married man in his own right, that I was faced with the morbid reality of my wife's secret sexcapades. Pastor Alonzo was a slick, fast-talking, cutthroat shark who dressed more like a U.S. senator than a man of the cloth. He pulled in a far bigger salary than one might expect a holy man to earn. A lot of people would be surprised to find out just how profitable the preaching business can be, especially when you head up the second biggest megachurch in California. Alonzo had a taste for life's opulent luxuries. He wasn't afraid to flaunt it. It wasn't uncommon for him to drive a Mercedes-Benz to church or show off his collection of Rolex watches during Sunday services. I guess that's why my wife gravitated towards him. 
she always did have a weak spot for material things. There was one thing that all the pastor's money couldn't buy him, though. Kids of his own. Whose wife, Darcy's on-again, off-again battle with the big C, had thrown a monkey wrench in his plans to start a family. Recently, her cancer had taken a turn for the worst, and she, she lied up in the hospital on her deathbed. The pastor and my wife were getting together for some extra Bible study sessions. When I confronted my wife about the emails, things got ugly. Names were called, expletives were hurled, and threats were thrown out by her, mostly. She explained to me that the pastor invited her and the kids to move in with him once Darcy passed, an offer my better half had accepted. She said she was going to give him the family he always wanted. Just so happened that that family was mine. I didn't have the money to fight a long, drawn-out custody battle or hire big-time lawyers, but Pastor Alonzo did. Couple that with the fact that women usually win these kinds of disputes, even if they don't always deserve it. And you can see why things were looking so bleak for me. Another man had stolen my wife, my children, my life. There was nothing I could do about it. The room slowly started spinning, and I realized my good friend Jack was up to his old tricks again. Nausea was beginning to settle in, and I didn't want to spend my last moments alive vomiting the Carl's Jr. cheeseburger I'd wolfed down an hour earlier. So I decided to stop stalling and finish what I came there for. I placed the revolver's barrel in my mouth and rested my finger on the trigger. In case you were wondering, if my life flashed before my eyes, allow me to be perfectly blunt. It didn't. And I was thankful for that, too. I could, I could think of a million things I'd rather have been doing than reliving the agony that woman had put me through. I shut my eyes as tight as possible in preparation for the bullet to pass through my brain. They say that he who hesitates is lost. In short, the proverb means that spending too much time deliberating on an important decision can ultimately lead to disastrous consequences. Although in my case, one tiny, minute moment of pause may have actually prevented said consequences and saved my life. The cold, metallic taste of the revolver's barrel on my tongue caused me to question my actions for only the briefest of seconds. But sometimes even that can be more than enough time to change a man's fortunes. And as I sat there, trying to talk myself into pulling the trigger, the telephone in my motel room rang. I slid the gun out of my mouth, sat good old Jack down on the nightstand, and answered the phone. Hello, I said in my best possible not-about-to-kill-myself voice. Jacob! I'm so glad you picked up! I had no idea who the voice on the other line belonged to. I'd never heard it before, but whoever it was, they seemed to know me. Listen, Jake, he said, he continued. Before you go and uh, redecorate the walls with the inside of your skull, we need to have a talk first. I hadn't told anyone where I planned on being that evening. But this guy not only knew my name and location, but even the fact that I was... that I was contemplating punching my ticket to the big toga party in the sky. Had he been watching me? I needed some answers. Using every working brain cell in my head, I came up with the most rational, thought-out, intelligent question I could construct. Uh... What? I said we need to have a talk, Jacob. Now sit tight. I'm on my way over there to your room right now. And with that, he hung up. I stared blankly at the wall, completely dumbfounded. My mind still trying to process what happened. I wondered for a moment if I had just been the victim of a prank call. It seemed from our short conversation that the guy on the other end of the line had been watching me. My first inclination was that he might have been some sort of pervert. I mean, I mean, after all, the motel wasn't exactly a four-star accommodation, and I did notice that the place looked to be a bit 
looking like a magnet for weirdos, freaks, and other types of seedy characters when I checked in. I took a swig of liquid courage. For some reason, I always felt braver when Jack was around. The knock on the door nearly caused me to lose control of my bowels. That double western bacon cheeseburger was coming out one way or the other. I tried to convince myself that I was being neurotic, but something about the call made me feel uneasy. I had become aware of a dark, inexplicable feeling that began bubbling from within the pit of my stomach. The moment the phone first rang, it was an awful combination of dread, fear, hate, and a myriad of other terrible emotions all simmering together into some kind of, some kind of unspeakable brew. Who is it? I called out. No one answered. I waited for a response and then tried again, this time with a little more bass in my voice. Who is it? I stood up from the bed, tucked the gun into the waistband of my pants, and zipped up my jacket, making sure that it was properly concealed before making my way towards the door. I said, who is it? Housekeeping. The voice on the other side of the door sounded like it belonged to an elderly Hispanic woman. Oh, uh, I chuckled at myself for letting a maid get me so riled up. Uh, please come back later, thank you. Housekeeping. I, I said come back later, please. You want sheep? By this point, the woman was seriously trying my patience. Either she didn't speak English or she was a complete moron. I can include toilet? There, there's a sign on the doorknob. Can't you read? I swung open the door, ready to give the woman a piece of my mind. It says, do not dis- There was no one in the hall. I leaned my head out of the room to see if the irritating maid wasn't bothering some other poor sap, but the corridor was completely barren. Convinced that I had officially lost my mind, I retreated back inside and closed the door behind me. Not a second later, the knocking started up again. Housekeeping! Go away! I shouted at the top of my lungs. Where'd she come from? Just moments earlier, I was alone in the halls. I changed tone. Listen! Please just leave me alone, I begged. There's no way in hell I'm letting you in. It was getting harder and harder to ignore the strange, dark sensation that was still stewing inside my stomach. I said, go away! Once more, I opened the door, and once more, there was not a cleaning woman in sight. This time, however, I was not alone. Doubled over in laughter before me was a teenage boy, no older than 16. He was wearing a forest green hoodie and a matching flat-billed baseball cap tilted off to the side, a fashion choice that made him look spectacularly douchey. His baggy jeans sagged halfway down his ass, exposing a pair of striped boxers and accenting his douchiness even further. A black bandana hung over his back pocket as if he was some kind of gangbanger, and I found this to be particularly stupid since he appeared to be some type of suburban white kid whose mom drove him to soccer practice in a minivan. Can I help you? I grunted. I was about ten seconds away from wringing the little twerp's neck. By the way, he was convulsing in laughter. It was clear that he was the mastermind behind the harassment. <laughs> oh, man! He managed to squeeze out between breaths. You should have seen yourself. You look like you just got caught with your dick in the family goat. What? The boy wiped tears from his eyes and took a deep exhale in an attempt to rein in his laughter. Damn, did that go over your head? Sorry. Now <laughs> that I think about it, the expression's a little... Before your time, it's it originated in Scotland around the mid 1700s. A lot more people owned goats back then, so I guess it used to be funnier. <laughs> well, when you when you've been around as long as I have, it's hard to stay caught up with the latest lingo. I mean, what what are all the kids saying these days, Jake? Is it is YOLO still a thing? You know what? Never mind. Uh, I came here to talk to you about something else. Uh, may I come in? No, no, you may not. I extended my arm around the door frame to block the entrance of my room. Why don't you get the hell out of here, kid? I'm busy. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But I, I only take a minute of your time, okay? The boy ducked under my arm, scrambling past me before I could stop him. 
Once inside, he paused for a moment, surveying the room and smiling snidely to himself. <laughs> Jeez, Jake. This place is a dump. Why the blazes would you want to blow your brains out here? I personally would have chosen the Ritz-Carlton uptown if I was going to off myself, you know? Oh, but not before ordering some of those delicious sweet potato truffle fries from the bar in the lobby. You've got about three seconds to get out of here, kid. I'm shaking in my boots. <laughs> he giggled briefly, then continued. Honestly, man, intimidation isn't your forte. I mean, I promise. I'll leave you in a second, but as I said before, I wanted to have a little chat first. What do you want? To help you out? You can help me by getting out of my room. Ooh, a little snippy, aren't we? Jacob, I know you've had a rough day, but it doesn't have to end the way you think it does. So what if your wife hurt you? Buck up! There's a way to remedy this situation. It was then that I realized the darkness inside of me had never gone away. Instead, it had been flourishing, spreading from my core as it pervaded throughout the rest of my body. How did this kid know so much about me? For a second time that evening, I was so rattled I could hardly spit out a sentence. Who are you? I said. He leaned in and cupped his ear like an old man whose hearing had waned over time. Were you... What? Watch. Was I wa 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 watching you? Is that what you, is that what you were going to say? <laughs> Learn to enunciate, man. Sorry to interrupt. But if I let you do all the talking, we're going to be here all night. And believe me when I tell you I've got other places to be. Now then... Why don't I answer your second question first? Yeah, I was w w w watching you, but not in a creepy staring at you through the window kind of way, you know, like Ryan Gosling and Drive. Did you ever see that movie? It is surprisingly good. And that Gosling, oh, he has got chops, I tell you. That guy is so damn handsome, too. I mean, <laughs> some lucky bastard just hit jackpot in the genetic lottery. Am I right? The kid was giving me a bad vibe. I slid my hand into my jacket pocket and I felt through the fabric for the handle of my revolver. All the while, he continued to blabber senselessly about how the Mickey Mouse Club was the greatest thing to ever happen to the entertainment industry. I needed to somehow get control of the situation. Like, Shut the hell up, kid! I shouted. You better give me some straight answers right now! Why were you watching me? The boy's smile quickly disappeared. He scanned me up and down, probing me with his eyes as if he was examining every inch of my body, a look of utter disgust on his face. It was bizarre. His very stare made me feel ashamed, violated. More questions, huh? First off, you should probably make sure the hammer isn't cocked on that little lemon squeezer you got. <laughs> You're gonna shoot your dick off. Then you'll really have a reason to kill yourself. Somehow he knew about the gun I was hiding under my coat. I unzipped my jacket and pulled it out of my pants. He was right. I left it cocked. I was watching you because I saw a doomed soul. A lost spirit, so to speak, who was about to let the bad guys win. I just can't bring myself to allow you to do that. <laughs> he moseyed over to the television and dragged his finger down the screen, leaving a spotless streak across the otherwise dust-covered glass. Take it from a guy who's been there before. I know exactly how you feel right now. I, too, have been betrayed by someone I loved. Cast down. Thrown out in favor of another. He paused for a moment. Looked down at the dust that covered his fingertip. But I haven't answered your first inquiry yet, have I? Who am I? <laughs> well, that's a loaded question. I am a man of many epithets. Over the years, I've been known as the bearer of light, son of perdition, even the, the proud one. In a story he once wrote, Washington Irving referred to me as Old Nick. I've been anointed a prince, though at the same time, Branded a beast. Wait, you're, you're telling me that you're the... Pleased to meet you! <gasps> Hope you guessed my name! But that's impossible. Why? You go to church, don't you? Is it so hard to believe that 
asinine little book. <laughs> the one that you people so arrogantly proclaim to be God's true word actually got something right. I mean, don't, don't go patting yourself on the back for being a Christian, though. I mean, the Bible's filled with more half-truths and garbage than a supermarket tabloid. <laughs> I was completely taken aback by what the boy was saying. A couple minutes earlier, I was getting ready to lodge a bullet in my brain, and I was talking to a teenager who had just declared himself to be... to be... the embodiment of evil. Look, if you're... the devil, I asked, then why do you look like a kid? <laughs> why not? I do as I please. I could appear as whatever or whoever I want. You think this is weird? Once I made myself look like a snake just so that I could talk to a hot naked chick. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, neither did Carlos Mencia's comedy career. But it happened anyway. By the way, I assure you, I had nothing to do with that. He shook his head. I suppose it's proof you require, eh? See, I miss the old days where the people would blindly take me for my word. It made it so much easier to cheat at poker. <laughs> The boy gave me a mischievous wink. All right. Why don't you pick up the phone? There's someone who needs to talk to you. Not a second later, a shrill, ear-splitting sound cut through the motel room. The telephone on the end table was ringing. I shot a skeptical look over at the teenager. He was holding his hands to his ear as if there was an invisible phone in it. Hello? I said as I picked up the call. Housekeeping. I clean now? As the boy's lips moved, I could hear the cleaning woman's voice over the phone. No playing glass, I come in. He burst into a fit of laughter. I was floored. I mean, I, I tried to play it cool, but I'm certain he could read the shock on my face. <laughs> Check this one out. <clears throat> he cleared his voice. I'm leaving you, Jacob. Now he sounded like my wife. Pastor Alonzo has a bigger house than you. As a matter of fact, that's not the only thing that's bigger. This sent him into another round of giggles. After he had his laugh, his voice returned to normal. Not bad, right? I mean, I'm no Danny Gans, but I bet I can still play the nugget. And when he said that, he smiled. But it was just a little too wide. Wider than a mouth should stretch. Ever so briefly, I caught a glimpse of his teeth. It was as if hundreds of tiny daggers were protruding from his gums. He shifted his head ever so slightly, and his peculiar facial features had disappeared. Once again, he looked like a typical teenager. You can't have my soul, I said. It's not for sale. The boy scoffed. Come on now. Do you really think I just go around buying people's souls from them? Ye have little faith in humanity, Jacob. Most people are too smart to fall for that kind of thing. And what's a lifetime of happiness compared to an eternity in hell? Then why are you here? Like I said before, I do as I please. And it would please me very much to do a favor for you. No contracts or souls involved. Honest engine. What kind of favor? I asked. He turned and stared out the door. You know, why don't you accompany me for a little walk? I'll explain. Oh, and bring that little, uh, pistol of yours. <laughs> As the boy exited my room, I picked up the phone again and held it to my ear. I didn't hear a dial tone, so I followed the cord only to find that it wasn't even plugged into the wall. Jack was still sitting on the nightstand waiting to provide consolation for me if I needed it. He was going to have to wait just a little longer. I followed the boy out the door. I caught up to him halfway down the hall, and together we headed down the rusty metal stairs, the ones led to the parking lot. I see that you're in a butt of a bind, Jacob. Your wife of 15 years is leaving you for that idiot pastor, and taking the kiddies with her. <laughs> what were their names again? Oh, yeah. Hunter and Elizabeth, such darling children. Leave my kids alone, I blurted out. My unexpected outburst surprised even myself, but hearing him mention my kids by name had set me off. 
He stopped halfway down the stairs and jabbed a bony finger into my chest. Listen here, tough guy. Just because I might happen to look like a boy band reject at the moment doesn't mean I won't turn into some sort of ten foot tall of crafty and monstrosity and bite your legs off if you continue to disrespect me, capiche? I nodded my head. Good. <laughs> I don't know what all the fuss was about anyway. I love children. I mean, I'm, I'd have one of my own, but it's so hard to find a suitable candidate to bear the antichrist, you know? There, there's something about heralding in a millennium of hell on earth and bringing about the apocalypse that turns most women off. The only people who ever volunteer for the job are nutballs and wackos, and trust me, Jake, I don't want no baby mama drama any more than you do. <laughs> I think he was making a joke because he paused for a second and glanced over to me as if he was expecting to hear laughs. He continued talking once he realized I didn't find him amusing. If you ask me, you have three options. Option number one, you go back to your room, you blow your brains out. You never see your kids again and your wife continues fucking the pastor. Option number two, you don't do anything. You don't like a pussy. Go back to your boring and now lonely existence. You'll see your kids the second Saturday of every month and your wife continues fucking the pastor. And I suppose this is where you tell me option three. When he made it to the base of the stairs, he gestured towards the parking lot, indicating the direction he wanted to walk. Smart man, he chortled. Option number three is this. You take that 32 caliber Smith & Wesson over to the pastor's McMansion tonight. Your wife's there right now uh, dis discussing church business. <laughs> he made a set of quotations in the air with his fingers when he said that. I'm sure he's got her down on her knees, taking communion as we speak, you know? Accepting the holy body inside her mouth and all that. Okay, okay, I get it. But that's a terrible joke. You don't even Catholic. What are you trying to say? You want me to kill Pastor Alonzo? Kill the pastor? Kill your wife? Hell, kill his annoying little shih tzu while you're at it. You have to kill them. You have to kill them, Jacob. Don't let them take your children from you. And their lives are trying to ruin yours. I'd do it for you, but no killing's one of the few rules I'm bound by on this miserable plane of existence. I had to admit... It was an idea that had crossed my mind earlier that night. More of a fantasy than anything. I never actually considered going through with it. But that would be a sin, I said. Now that I know that hell exists, there's no way I'd do anything to risk damnation. Oh, look who you're talking to, Jacob! Don't you think I have a little bit of pull down there? I mean, for this one particular night, I might... Absolve you of your sins. I mean, think of it as a get-out-of-jail-free card. And don't worry about the fuzz, either. I mean, I have friends in high places. You wouldn't even be considered a person of interest in the murder investigation. I couldn't believe I was even entertaining that idea. I'd become so engrossed in what the satanic little douchebag was proposing, that I didn't even realize he was leading us to my car until we were standing right in front of it. So, if it's not my soul you want... What are you getting out of this? Ah, I see my reputation precedes me. Like I said before, I'm just doing you a solid, man. He stuck his fist out waiting for me to bump it. I left the devil hanging. Now maybe one day in the future you'll repay the favor. You know, or not. You certainly wouldn't be obligated to. What kind of favor? Well, I don't know. Pick up my dry cleaning. I haven't thought of it yet. I mean, who cares? I may never even bother you after tonight. I reminisced back to when my wife and I were young. We were so in love, and now... Now I was standing in a parking lot under the neon lights of the world's dirtiest roach motel, letting the baby-faced demon talk me into murdering her. How did it come to this? She's my wife, I said. Part of me still loves her. I, I don't know if I could do anything that would harm the mother of my children. He rolled his eyes. 
Oh, and clearly she loves you too. I mean, why else would she be on her back right now letting the pastor plow her in the next week? And when he said that, his voice grew deeper. A thousand octaves lower than anything I'd ever heard in my life. The sound was maddening. It had me wanting to bury my fingers into my ear canals until my eardrums burst. Your adventurous whore of a wife sins with that slimy, two-faced, sorry excuse for a human being as we speak. If that wasn't enough, she plans on taking your children and half your money. And for what? Because you don't have a big house or a fancy car, she used you until something better came along. And she did the same thing to his wife. Hell is filled with men and women like them. Send them where they belong. It felt as though his voice was microwaving my brain from the inside. I grabbed my head and I fell to my knees. That pastor sins in God's name with your wife, and you want to let them get away with it? Send them to hell, Jacob. Send them to me, and I will make them suffer until the end of time. Okay! I cried. I'll do it! I'll do it. Excellent! His voice had conveniently reverted back to normal. Let's get started! Shall we? I'll meet you over at the pastor's house. I'd ride with you, but, you know, I'm the lord of fucking darkness, and you drive a Prius, so, you know. Even though he wasn't in the car with me as I drove over to Pastor Alonzo's home, I knew that I was far from alone. Every time I doubted my sanity, every time I started to question if what had transpired was even real, he was there, standing on a street corner, waiting at a bus stop, even watching me from the windows of other cars as they passed me by. I realized now that he was keeping an eye on me, making sure that I didn't get cold feet. It came as no surprise to find him already waiting for me on the front steps of the pastor's massive house when I pulled up. He placed a hand on my shoulder when I got near and spoke some final words of encouragement to motivate me. You're doing the right thing, Jacob. He said, just remember, they had this coming. <laughs> From the moment I nudged open the pastor's gaudy, oversized front door, I could hear him and my wife wailing away from the bedroom upstairs. I drew my gun and I followed the moans up the stairs. A little devil followed close behind. Jeez, Jake, sounds like a couple of pigs getting slaughtered in there. <laughs> Is that what it was like when you two used to bump uglies? I brushed off his inconsiderate quip that leaned against the bedroom door once I got upstairs. The boy was licking his lips in anticipation. It seemed as if he wanted them dead worse than I did. Doubt began to seep into my mind. I was no killer. The very thought of murdering the mother of my children was beginning to make me feel sick. Perhaps, sensing apprehension, he started whispering in my ear. Do it, Jake. Send them to hell. His words were easy to ignore. My kids were all I could think about. Could I really take their mother away from them? Even though I let that boy manipulate me that evening, I still, I still had my free will. I knew that I had the power to walk out the front door if I wanted to. No one needed to die. He who hesitates is lost, Jake. How could I even pull the trigger? And for God's sakes, I still loved the woman. That's... That's when that dark, inexplicable feeling that had begun to grow inside me started to dwindle. In its place? I felt hope. Hope that maybe if I could talk to her, even hear her speak, I would come to my senses. Then, almost on cue, her voice rang out, resounding through the air like a magnificent melody plucked from the fingers of a masterpiece harpist. Fuck me, preacher man. I kicked in the door. My gun had six bullets. But it only took me three. Would have been two. But I couldn't resist the opportunity to relieve the pastor of his... Holy Scepter. It's strange how draining murder can be. All I did was point my gun and pull a trigger, yet my body felt like I had just run a marathon. 
I knew you had it in you, Jacob, but holy hell, I didn't expect you to blast off his pecker, too. It wasn't his wisecrack that startled me. The boy's voice had suddenly changed. It was deeper than a teenager's now, more dignified. Perhaps more alarming, it was a voice I knew very well. The one I heard echo off the windows of my church every Sunday for years. Pastor Alonzo's voice. I whirled around to see the man I had just shot smiling at me from the doorway. Relax, he said as he entered the room. It's just me, Lucifer, the king of the underworld, father of lies, yada yada yada. I looked back to the bed. The real pastor's bullet-ridden body still laid motionless next to my wife's corpse. Their cadavers entwined within a set of tacky, blood-stained bedsheets. Why do you look like Pastor Alonzo now? I asked. Why does it matter? I do as I please. Before I had a chance at a follow-up question, the thunderous sound of the pastor's front door being slammed shut carried through the house and up to the bedroom. My heart began to race as the bevy of heavy footsteps made their way up the stairs. What the hell's going on? I demanded, but the trickster didn't answer me. There was a wicked grin painted across his face. It sent a wave of fright through my body. Do you know what they're going to do to you in prison, Jacob? He said with a sneer. Two uniformed police officers strode into the room. As the policemen made their way towards me, my panic began to intensify. All I could think about was wasting the rest of my life away in prison, forced to play housewife at the behest of my cellmate, a tattooed skinhead named Knife Face. I still had three bullets left, and I knew there was one way out of the situation. I raised a revolver to my temple as the cops marched towards me. I didn't know if I really would have pulled the trigger had they attempted to arrest me, but thankfully... I didn't get the chance to find out. Because instead of drawing their guns on me, they brushed right by without saying a word. I watched in awe as they started wrapping the pastor and my wife's bodies in the solid silk sheets. To my surprise, they appeared to be cleaning up my mess. You know who fell to the floor and began howling. <laughs> now you really do look like you got caught with your dick in the family goat. <laughs> He thrust a finger into my bewildered face. I'm just joshing you, Jake. These fine gentlemen are with me. Them too. He thumbed over to the doorway. Two more men I hadn't noticed were wearing plain clothes, but still brandishing badges and were waiting in the doorway. Jerry, come over here for a second. The older, heavyset man sauntered towards us. His somber face and reluctant gait made him look like a kid who had just got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. The no longer baby-faced demon patted him on the back. Do you know who this man is, Jacob? I stood up. I shook my head. Jerry here is the head of the police department, and that means he's very important. Pleased to meet you, I said. I really wasn't. At that point, all I wanted to do was distance myself as far from the pastor's house as possible and forget the whole night ever happened. The police chief remained silent. The shame and discomfort in his eyes told me the feeling was mutual. The demon gestured over to the other man still standing at the door. That guy over there just made detective. He turned his head towards him. Hey, congratulations on your new promotion, Bill. The detective looked away to avoid eye contact. Once again, my partner for the evening focused his attention on me. Guess who's going to be heading up your wife's murder case? What about the pastor? I asked. Who's going to be looking into his murder? He stretched his arms out and twirled around as if he was showing off a brand new coat. What are you talking about? Pastor Alonzo wasn't murdered. He just suddenly decided to do missionary work in Africa. See? Everything wraps up nice and tidy and you get off scot-free. Now, Jacob, before you leave tonight, I wanted to speak to you about that favor. What? You know... We talked about this. I said that maybe one day I might ask you to return the favor I did for you. You remember? Yeah, I said. I remember. I, I guess I didn't expect it to come so soon. Yeah, well, life's kind of funny like that. Huh? <laughs> Don't worry about it, though. There's really nothing you can't do in your sleep. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to pick up and dispose of dead bodies like these suckers. What do you want? He leaned in close, 
and looked at me with a solemn expression on his face. Listen to me, Jacob, because this is the only favor I will ever ask of you. It's imperative that you never attempt to contact Darcy Alonzo. Do you understand? What? His request had left him puzzled for numerous reasons, but Darcy Alonzo is terminal cancer she's dying his lips curled into a devilish smirk well let's just say I I, I I did her a little favor what are you gonna do with her what's it matter to you I do as I please I waved my finger in his face but you said I'm not obligated to listen to you right if I wanted to I could go over to the hospital right now and tell her about everything that just happened tonight of course you could do that Jacob like I said, there's no binding agreement between us. Your soul is yours. You're free to do what you want to do with it. As a matter of fact, I stake no claim to any of these men's souls. I mean, they're just people who are kind enough to repay the favor I did to them. You, you see, I've done favors for a lot of people, Jacob. Cops, judges, lawyers, even pedophiles who take pleasure in the rape and murder of children. I mean, hell, that reminds me, don't you have kids? They walk home from school every day. And when he said that, he looked me right in the eye. It was as if his stare caused my mind to play out a thousand different scenarios, each one more heinous and vile than the last. Those eyes were like looking through a window into hell. Darcy and I are going away, he continued. All you have to do is forget about her. <laughs> forget about this entire night if you want, but but don't forget. I'm always watching you, Jacob. He didn't need to say another word. The message was clear. I turned and I exited the pastor's house without looking back. The next few hours, if they were a blur... To me. I, I remember driving back to my home, vomiting in the kitchen sink. That double western bacon cheeseburger finally did make its escape, and then passing out on the couch in my living room. My wife's body was found 48 hours after I shot her inside of a liquor store dumpster. Just as he said, I was never even considered a suspect. Her murder was pinned on some 19-year-old kid from the hood who had never even met her took no more than a week for the jury to reach a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to death. The kid is currently incarcerated and trying to appeal the jury's decision, but something tells me he won't have any luck. I have a feeling that I'm not the only person who has a favor to repay. Darcy Alonzo checked out of the hospital that evening and was gone by morning. Word around the church was that she and the pastor had believed her miraculous recovery to be a sign from God. So they sold their house and set out across the globe to spread his message. If you ask me, though, that story is a bigger load of bullshit than a politician making a campaign speech while rolling in a pile of fertilizer. It was hard for my children to lose their mother at such a young age, but they've been learning to get along without her. You know? I like to think that I've been doing a hell of a job as a single parent, cooking, cleaning, taking care of them. It took a while for things to get back to normal for us, but they're finally smiling and laughing again. About a year after everything had happened, I received a letter in the mail. I didn't think much about it at first. It was the middle of December. I had already collected dozens of Christmas cards. It wasn't until I had tore open the envelope that I realized... That dark, inexplicable sensation had made its presence known once again at the pit of my stomach. The message inside the card was short, but it hit me like a punch to the gut. Merry Christmas from the Alonzos. The doctor says we're due to have the best Christmas ever. Attached to the card was a picture of Darcy and the pastor wearing ugly Christmas sweaters and grinning from ear to ear. Darcy's sweater, however, pulled up past her midsection 
exposing her belly. And she looked to be about nine months pregnant. We've all been there. You've just gone to a certain place at a certain time on a certain date, done a special thing, and the thing you suspected would happen has just fucking happened. Not to mention the fact that you've just seen whatever the fuck it is that lives in your mirror, been told in detail how you're going to die, and the highly demonic and invincible thing that you summoned is headed towards you. Also, your family are all dead. Your friends are all missing, and you've been framed by someone with access to your bedroom. What the fuck do you do now, sweet protagonist? Well, you've come to the right place. These are the simple rules one must follow in order to firstly not become the victim of creepy pasta, and furthermore, to come out kicking if the worst does happen. With the help of this guide, you too can merely be a catatonic, traumatized wreck, as opposed to the guy currently being worn as a coat by some dude who roams a lot. Just keep these simple rules in mind. Number one, mirrors and darkness don't mix. Number two, actually mirrors in general are a no in the creepypasta world. There is nothing more sinister. Number three, there is zero chance of survival if you look at the thing that no one else can see or answer its question incorrectly. Number four, if you are alone at night in a creepy mental institution, take some time to consider what the fuck you're doing there, then, if it is appropriate to do so, leave. Number five, avoid going to places where everyone else who went there never came back and died inexplicably. Number six, if anyone stops your vehicle at night and asks you to come with them, it would probably be in your best interest to politely decline. Number seven, Killing is the last method of survival. Use it sparingly, but without fear. Number eight. Who was phone? It's always a good thing to ponder. And who the hell answers a phone while having sex with a dead person's sexy daughter? Number nine. Get a simple 38 revolver, load it with two silver bullets. If you really feel there's no chance to come out alive of a situation, take one shot at whatever it is that's threatening you. If that doesn't work, you still have one last shot to become an hero with. Number ten. Area 51 is simply too well guarded to let you in, or let any aliens out. Number 11. When going to a hotel, try to steer clear of unauthorized areas. If you couldn't resist, but you saw a red thing, take some time to consider the price range and hotel standard on your next visit. Have you ever stayed at a haunted Hilton? Number 12. When booking your hotel stay, TripAdvisor can be invaluable in deeming whether your choice is a source of multiple murders, full of dead people, or built on the mouth of hell. Local newspapers can also be helpful. Number 13. Invoking demons, speaking weird languages, and performing rituals of any kind is considered dangerous. Refrain from doing that, especially around abandoned warehouses, churches, psychiatric institutions, the woods, and your house in front of a mirror at night. Number 14. When going to a new area, environmental understanding is key to survival. Ask around for cursed places, legends, dangers, and other details. Listen to the local people's advice, and do not be afraid to ask if you're unsure of which attacks or disappearances are paranormal and which aren't. Number 15. Always have a Bible next to your bed. Provides average reading material and proof of beliefs, and a really heavy and effective object to throw at enemies. Number 16. Don't count on holy water. Get a sturdy vial of sulfuric acid and let a priest consecrate it. Number 17. Japanese priests cleanse rooms by waving katana swords around. This ritual is 100% effective on corporeal forms. Number 18. If you find 666 messages in your phone, mailbox, email, etc., consider changing the said service provider. Also, don't bother listening to or reading these messages. It's spam. Extra dimensional? Possibly, but spam nonetheless. Number 19. Old pharmaceutical companies can't help you, unless... You specifically need blood of the innocent, snake oil, or radioactive syrup, which is never. Number 20. If you need to sign it in blood, you don't need to sign it. All mainstream governing bodies will accept contracts signed in ink. Bear this in mind if offered deals that seem too good to be true. Number 21. Lighthouses are dangerous. Avoid them at all costs. If you work at a lighthouse, consider a career in insurance sales or veterinary care. Have you ever read Three Skeleton Key? Number 22, there is simply no reason to listen to music that causes suicidal tendencies. Number 23, or to watch films that have strange or disastrous consequences. 
Number 24. If you like to plan ahead and have some money, buy your auntie and uncle a house in Bel Air. Nothing can harm you there, no matter how scared your mother is. Number 25. Secret, secluded, untouched places in old buildings are left untouched for a reason. Pioneers never say die, but in fact, they do have an unusually high mortality rate. Number 26. Before you start swimming in the ice-cold waters of murky lakes at the center of a dark forest at midnight, ask yourself, do you really want to travel to an ancient and terrifying city? If the answer is no, then stay at home instead and watch whatever quality programming is available on Cinemax, which means boobs. Number 27. On your 33rd birthday, try celebrating in a well-lit house with the company of others. Number 28. Refrain from using the one true name for anything. There is probably a reason people gave it a nick. Number 29. Watching TV static for too long may be hazardous to your health. Try satellite TV or Freeview to combat this problem. Netflix and internet streaming is also effective. Number 30. Get a cat. Those furry little hairballs seem to perceive unnatural phenomenon better than us, and if desperate, simply throw it at whatever it is about to get you. Number 31. Safety in numbers. If you're getting a bit too freaked out, grab a few friends, any and all firearms, and avoid the area in question. Number 32. Cemeteries are bad places, especially in foggy conditions and on Halloween. Number 33. Try not to close your eyes. Ever. If you must do so, do so only briefly. If something has moved from its original location in the time that it has taken you to blink, it is recommended that you do not blink again until you have dealt with said object. Fire is presumably the best method. Number 34. If you ever find an unmarked tape which contains the file extension .avi, even if it is your favorite kid's show, do not, under any circumstances, watch that tape. Now, if the extension is .mts, it is a different matter altogether. Number 35. If you hear chanting, run until you are out of earshot. Number 36. If you are too old to play with dolls, you do not need to be anywhere near one of those creepy little fuckers. Number 37. Legends can offer valuable insight of where not to go camping with friends. Number 38. When babysitting, ascertain the family's tastes and preferences to avoid being killed by poorly selected statues. Number 39. Even if you are certain that running will not save you, it is always best to try. Number 40. If you go to buy a used video game, whether it's at a GameStop or a garage sale, never ever buy one with a weird looking cartridge. This includes strange colors and ripped off labels with titles written in marker. The latter tends to happen more often than not. For the daring, don't just buy said game to become famous. Your chances of becoming an internet celebrity because of it can only work if you know how to program. You shall also be highly suspicious of games priced too cheaply and bootlegs. Number 41. If you decide to buy the used game anyway, rip that son of a bitch out of your console the moment it starts acting funny and take a hammer to it. Number 42. If you ever see a strangely new looking doorway with a strange face on it on a building that you swore you didn't see at first and the building happens to be an old chateau, don't fucking open it. Number 43. It's probably best to refrain from looking up on Google the phrase huskies with grins you'll end up having to spread the word. Number 44, never allow anyone to take a picture of you with an outdated camera. If it's too late, your only bet is to gamble with death or just trap him in a photo. That works too. Number 45, don't play with dolls if they come with a needle or a defect, especially a defect. Number 46, burn Ouija boards but be sure to have one of those car fresheners handy. The real reason why spirits get pissed off is because of that foul aroma that it produces when burned. Number 47, never confront animated puppets physically. Subdue them with spells, or they'll come back with minions or in a real physical body. Number 48, if you find yourself unable to escape, dancing may ward off the entity. Doing the hokey pokey is known to ward off curious monsters, but you might have to do the moonwalk to deal with zombies. Number 49. If you're checking your computer for viruses and you go too deep into System 32, refrain from clicking on any .avi files. If you do not heed this warning, creepy videos on you, dude. Number 50. If you see old tapes containing the words happy or appy, pretend you never saw them. Just go on with your life. It'll just end up invoking some whacked out, coked up director of an old children's show and you'll wind up having to pull some thanks for the ride shit on him. Number 51. 
If you buy a used camcorder and find the previous owner left one of their tapes inside, refrain from watching that tape, no matter how tempting it might be. Number 52. Be careful when buying an old secondhand TV. Number 53. If you see a guy with both an incredibly large smile and black and white eyes, extricate yourself from the premises post haste. Number 54. Don't go to a friend's house to bake cupcakes if they have random spurts of insanity. Number 55. Phone companies with low coverage are best avoided. Number 56. .exe files with strange names are not safe. Don't open them. Number 57. For the love of Neptune, turn off your fucking faucet when you're done with it. Number 58. If you're too old to not look behind you, it's better to do so, unless you're against a wall. Number 59. Also, don't listen to anybody who tells you to go to sleep. It's better to run away. Number 60. If you see a tall man with tentacles, run. Number 61. Don't enter strange websites. Number 62. Don't enter strange places. Number 63. Not even strange videos. Number 64. If a woman who covers her mouth asks you if she's beautiful, tell her she's average. It'll prevent her from slicing your mouth. Number 65. No good could ever come from owning a shiny Pokemon. Number 66. If you're an intern at a cartoon studio and you happen to be reviewing a new episode, make sure the episode is safe for work before viewing that shit. Number 67. Don't be so excited when being asked to look behind you. But don't take forever. No reason to keep certain death waiting. Number 68. Weird shit in Europe won't hurt you in the United States. Leave that to creeps. Number 69. Weird shit in the United States won't hurt you in Europe. Number 60. Should you break rule 54, there is always a chance of rescue. Number 71. If your brother is tired of noise... Or if your close friend has a brother like that, refrain from going into his basement unless you want to be tortured and killed. Number 72. If you buy a memory card and has saved data on it, delete all the saves. Number 73. If you get a drawing of Sonic on a disc and the only file on that disc is a .exe file called Sonic, don't play it. Destroy it or a demonic being that looks like a Sonic plushie might kill you. If he chooses not to, he will scar you for life. Number 74. If you see what appears to be a 12-year-old kid with black shorts, a gray, bloody shirt, red shades, dark gray skin, and a manic grin do not, under any circumstances, piss him off. Unless you're a werepire or brave. Number 75. Neighbors may have a darker side. If they do things that seem off for them, act normal. Number 76. In addition to Rule 77, if you hear foreign voices from your body, that means that you've been body jacked. Rule 77. If you are an adult and notice that you are being stalked by a guy with a black suit, long arms, and no face, reach for the nearest child and throw him or her at him, and then run like hell. Rule 78. If you are a child in the same situation, run like hell before said adult uses you to satisfy aforementioned beings, cravings, or hungers. If you do not manage to escape before the adult snags you, try bargaining with the Slender Man that the adult has more delicious flesh. Number 76. The Slender Man, or said monster depicted in the last two tips, feeds on paranoia. If you remember Slenderman only wants a hug, he won't go after you. But if Slenderman does stalk you, run. Number 80. If all else fails, give Slenderman $20 and he will leave you alone. Number 81. If you see someone crawling around, it's more likely to be something, and you don't want any more information than that. Number 82. If you're a police officer, state trooper, FBI agent, or any person of authority, and you have two days left until retirement, if you happen to notice anything suspicious or dangerous to health, get the fuck out of there immediately. Number 83. If you're being chased by any creepypasta and feel that you are 100% out of options, attempt to run to wherever Stephen King is doing his next book signing. Your killer will be far too interested to try to get an autograph to remember what they're doing in that situation in the first place. If Stephen King is not on your general vicinity at the time, R.L. Stein is also available. Number 84. If you are a creepypasta reader and feeling like things are getting a little too real, take a break. Number 85. If you find a magic stick that lets you draw living creatures, don't draw yourself. You may be surprised how pissed off your creation can get at you. Number 86. If you wake up in the middle of the woods after falling asleep and listening to your own heartbeat, take notice that someone probably put you there. But don't call the police. Publish a book of it and get a movie deal. Number 87. If you're being offered an orange by a demon, don't take it. Or... Follow the steps from rules 89. 
Number 88. On the third day of the third month of every 33rd year, seal up all the openings in your house unless you want to be eaten by an evil mist. Number 89. If you notice that you're being stalked by a screaming child in a skull mask, don't always assume the kid is evil. Just be sure to save the bunch of crunch should you have any. Number 90. When reminiscing about your favorite kids show on a message board, take a moment to consider if the episode where all children scream their lungs out was real or not. Also, take a moment to consider if the entire show was real or not. Number 91. When looking through mysterious blood-soaked pictures left in your mailbox, check to make sure that you locked your doors and windows. Number 92. Remember, snowmen have feelings too. Number 93. Stitches is naked. Covering him with a towel will cause him to die. Do so. Number 94. If your friend disturbingly edits tapes, it's probably a good idea to never see him again. Number 95. If you keep finding broken glass in your home, check to see if the shards match the colors of the glass object that was broken. They don't. Run. Number 96. If Jeff the Killer shows up in your bedroom, unarmed, and invites you to follow him to his home, for God's sake, don't. Number 97. Should you notice that your friend has suddenly developed a personality that's a mix between Heath Ledger's Joker and Beetlejuice, he or she is most likely inhabited, and it would be best to steer clear of this person until they return to their normal, boring as fuck personality. Number 98. If you encourage a small creature that looks like a mutant forearm baby with Jeff the Killer's face, don't listen to it. Not even if it offers you gold. Number 99. If you're still using Windows XP and you use it every day with the internet, sticking with it is a pretty stupid decision. End of support means more doors open for viruses and even more doors open for crazy shit. Number 100. Stay far, far away from abandoned amusement parks. <sighs> Number 101. If your son starts talking about some sort of doll from any game, do not play the fucking game. Take the gaming system and play baseball with it. Number 102. If you do play the game and later you hear any tapping at any place in your home, yell to your child to lock their door and jump from a window. It is wise to then light the house on fire and then jump from the window with your spouse. Number 103. Be atheist or convert to any religion that isn't monotheism. So when a monster says, I am God, or an insane man says, God has abandoned us, you will chuckle, since it is an overused cliche. Instead of getting scared by your broken faith, church always fails to save you from creepypastas, and the Bible is only as good as any other heavy object to throw, so there's no real benefit anyway. Number 104. Always think twice before doing something stupid or doing something that you might regret. Number 105. If you come across a pro wrestling DVD you haven't heard of, it was likely never released for a reason. Number 106. If you're browsing the internet and a colorful pop-up ad says, you win, you lose, or you die, for God's sake, don't click on it. Number 107. If a magic eight ball gives you anything but yes, no, or maybe, destroy it. 108. Do not go to any halfway house or mental institution you can get yourself into, in any city, in any country, unless your name happens to be Legion. Number 109. If you do end up in any halfway house or mental institution you can get yourself into, do not talk to the receptionist at the front desk. Instead, read a magazine, pamphlet, or any source of reading material on one of the tables in the waiting area, unless your name is Legion. Number 110. If you do talk to said receptionist at the front desk of the halfway house or mental institution, do not ask for anyone whose name could be the holder of blank, unless your name is Legion. Number 111. Do not collect all 538 objects. There is a reason why they must never come together, unless your name is Legion. Number 112, if you find a bag with dozens of tapes inside it, just fucking leave it alone. It might be some kid you punched in the face a while ago and is now out to kill everyone. Number 113, there are some parts of YouTube you should not be in. Number 114, do not kill anyone because you made a page on a website and an admin or some someone deleted it. Just don't. It's probably... Go read a book or something. Number 115. If you buy used wireless headphones off the internet, rip those bitches off your head as soon as you can. Number 116. If you attempt to bypass a level in an extremely hard typing game, you might find yourself trying to kidnap children whilst wearing a chef hat. Number 117. In addition to rule 117, there's probably a reason why that level is so goddamn hard. Number 118. If you go camping in the woods and find a cabin, you should probably leave it alone. You watch the movies.
Number 119, everyone's scared of something. If you're not scared of anything, well then you're a liar. Number 120, when playing Minecraft, do not set the render distance to tiny. Number 121, if you do set the render distance to tiny and you can see a mob that looks like Steve in the distance, set render distance to full. Number 122, if said mob is still in sight, delete the game. Number 123, if said mob, known as Herobrine, is in every game, delete Minecraft. Number 124, if you are in your bedroom at night and you wake up to see a feeble looking gray humanoid at the end of your bed, do not hesitate in throwing your covers over it and trying to punch it to death. And maybe put that Bible that was mentioned earlier to good use. Number 125, if previously mentioned creature escapes one's grasp, it will stalk you and maul you. So if sighted again, run. Number 26, monsters still bleed. If forced to fight one, don't think that all is lost. Number 27, better safe than sorry. If you do kill whatever it is that's attacking you, don't think that you're safe yet. Shoot or stab them in every vital organ you can think of and sever limbs. Burning the corpse and or putting it through a meat grinder helps too. Number 28, if a banshee is screaming the living shit out of you, then that's the only sign that you're going to die a slow, painful death. Number 129. If you have a Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon card that is a very ominous force, as in it either creates death or magic that you have never imagined, either burn the card or cut it to pieces with scissors. Abandoning it, or taking it to the trash, would simply be making you its next victim. Number 130. Demonic or spiritual forces can enter any object or person with ease, and can be kept out of the body by letting a priest or group of priests do an exorcism as long as you or any member of your family aren't the cause of it. Number 131. Seek a fortune teller if you happen to have a spiritual experience that would affect your future. Number 132. Rap Rat is not a song artist. In fact, stay away from anything that concerns him. Number 133. Slenderman does not always kill out of hunger or boredom. If he's stalking you, ask yourself if your death would benefit humanity. If it would, then just throw in the towel, because he's coming. Don't believe me? Go ask all those Nazi soldiers found impaled on trees. Number 134. Hide and seek is an evil game. 135. Before you consider those horrible figments of your deranged imagination your friends, take a good look at their face. If they have yellow eyes or impossibly deformed, take as many pills as your local pharmacist will give you. Number 136, if you suspect that an immortal, armless monster wants to put a foot through your stomach, run. Number 137, if your walls bleed, phrases that make no sense, try reading them backwards. Number 138, if your walls start bleeding in the first place, it's best to burn the house down. Number 139, if that one wall is miraculously unburned, run. Number 140, get in shape. The only thing that you could do to evade the majority of creepypastas is run. Number 141. If you're a paraplegic, make like happy wheels and fashion some rockets. Number 142. If any kind of man or beast appears in your room in the middle of the night, then it's best to stab it. And stab it. Number 143. If you have no other weapon, put that Bible I told you to keep next to your bed to good use. And number 144. The creepypastas that become famous can't be forced. They just happen. If you are deliberately putting yourself in danger against powerful, extremely bloodthirsty beings so that you can write a non-profit story to put onto a Wikia webpage, well, it might be time to accept that you're a complete fucking asshat. Follow these simple rules and little or massive harm may befall you. But either way, the important thing is to make sure that your tale is told, copied, and pasted repeatedly forever yours management hey there kids it's me mr creepypasta and i wanted to give you a big big thank you for sticking with me through the entirety of this video or podcast episode or what have you and for staying with me for the past 10 years it's been a hell of a ride and i couldn't do any of it without you and I want to give a very special thank you to all of you who support me on Patreon. Because, quite honestly, you guys help me keep the lights on in my house. And I can't thank you enough for that. 
A very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Canon Lando Higuchi, Chumbinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G. Weevil 3, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Miranda Jeffries, Hul Gungshi, Justin Johnson, Raven Hart, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason V.B. Wilson, Infernal One, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much. Like, seriously. Thank you guys so, so much. And if you would like to be able to join them, you always can at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta. I love you guys. Seriously. All of you who support on Patreon, who follow, who subscribe, those of you who listen, and those of you who lurk, thank you for the amazing 10 years and sweet dreams. <laughs>